Welcome to the Single Use Products Working Group, uh, meeting number two. Today's uh, September 24th. So uh, to get started, just make sure everyone knows everyone's name for who's up at the table and around in the room. Let's just quickly go around the table and introduce uh, ourselves to each other again into the audience. Andy Hackman on behalf of America. Jen Holiday with the Chittenden Solar Waste District. John Letty with the Northwest Solar Waste District. I'm Lauren Hurl with Vermont Conservation Voters. Uh, Chris Bray from the Addison Senate District. Good morning. Jim McCullough from the brave little hamlet of Williston. Uh, Gwen Zaka, Vermont Lake of Cities and Towns. Uh, Kim Crosby with Casella Waste Management. Stephanie Gorman, Duo Restaurant in Rathlin. Kathy Jameson, ANR, Solid Waste Program. So, uh, thank you everyone. And uh, I have one quick question for Mike Ferris. Yes. Uh, Erin Segrist, who's on the panel, was traveling today. Do you know if she's going to be able to call in? Um, she can. I don't know what the is like. Okay. So I'll email her that information and I'll set it up. Great. When, when you're ready, just jump in and we'll keep going. Um, with that, I uh, wanted to, um, I don't know if anyone has any questions before we get started. We have an EPR-oriented agenda to get going. So great. Um, Kathy, do you want to lead us off? Excellent. Uh, good afternoon for the record. I'm Kathy Jamison. I'm the Solid Waste Program Manager at the Agency of Natural Resources. And thank you again for having me. Um, so, um, the Single Use uh, Products Working Group. Um, today, what I'd like to do is just really quickly brief review of the points um, um, I made last meeting. Um, and then jump into uh, what is EPR, just really high level, very briefly, before explaining the Vermont EPR programs that we have um, already in their effectiveness. And the other charge that I was um, assigned today is how would an EPR system, um, what, what would we look for in Vermont to apply an EPR system to single use packaging? So with that, last time when we talked about single-use products, they're being produced and consumed at, a, at an increasing rate. Um, they are comprising a significant portion of our landfill capacity, about one-third of what Vermonters throw away, um, is, um, is um, attributed to single-use products. Of those single-use products thrown away, only about half of them can be recycled with our current recycling system. And as many of you know, the cost of recycling has really increased quite a bit in the last year and a half. And it, it's at a point where we're getting a large number of complaints, and it's, it's um, what we're concerned about is that people might not, con not, might not continue recycling the current amount that's being recycled let alone have a system where we can put more materials into our recycling system. And, and then fourthly, um, we also went over some of the negative environmental impacts, effects from single-use products. And then um, our charge with Act 1, um, with Act 69, um, we, we are to review a list of seven items. This, um, today is EPR, which is one of those items, the lens that the law gives us to look through that to kind of is how I look at it is like this is our true norm is how are we going to make recommendations that reduce um, single use product use, uh, reduce the impact of these products to the environment, Welcome. have a system that's um, improved. Um, you told while we place you into so your conference. Away less of these materials and there's less impact to the environment. So that's kind of the lens. So, um, Kathy, not all uh, single-use products can be recycled. Only about half are currently disposed of. Is that does that fifty percent represent exclusively the the ones that cannot be recycled, or does or are they also does that also include ones that can be but are not being recycled? Uh, to be clear, it's it's um, of the 155,000 tons of single-use products that we're throwing away annually, half of that, so about 75,000 tons, can't be recycled. Cannot be. Cannot be, okay. not their current system. Think about all the 
uh, film plastic that we have, or um, materials that have multiple composite layers, so that it's, it's you know it's, it's plastic, it's a metal, it's aluminum, or whatever. And those materials we in our current recycling system um, won't fit. Right. Yeah. Maybe it could fit in a future recycling system. Not today. Thank you. Okay, so jumping ahead, what is EPR? So in simple terms, what extended producer responsibility is, 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 is extending or making the producer, the manufacturer of these products have responsibility throughout the life chain of the product. So it's product management. And in the past, or currently with some of these products, once the producers, once it's sold, then the, the manufacturer usually is done, right? And then it's up to consumers or, or um, municipalities or solid waste districts to figure out how do we have a home for this? And who's paying for it? With EPR, the manufacturer is assisting with that management at the, when, when the consumer is no longer using that material. Um, so PSI, Product Stewardship Institute, which you'll hear more from later today, has um, a com more complete definition, and that is it's a mandatory type of product stewardship that includes, at a minimum, the requirement that a producer's responsibility for their product extends to the post-consumer management of that product and its packaging. There are two key related features uh, to EPA policy. One is the shifting of the financial and management responsibility from the government oversight upstream to the producer and away from the public sector. One. And two is to provide incentives so that the producer incorporates environmental considerations into the design of their products, because that's what they have control over. You know, consumers, municipalities, families have no control over the design of these products, how they're packaged, and how they're sold as a consumer. We're just stuck with that at the end of its life. Um, so what are the benefits? Why do we why do we care? Right? Um, and so we, we want to have a, a system that does incentivize manufacturers to make changes that are positive, to use less packaging, have that packaging be less toxic, have that packaging be um, more environmentally friendly, uh, perhaps better to recycle, um, and, or reduce the content altogether, which would be even the, the best benefit. As I said last time, the best benefit that we have to the environment is to reduce the material. Whenever we can reduce, we are, we are providing a better outcome. Um, EPR also uh, provides convenient collection systems. And now with our Vermont EPR programs, and I'll get into that in a moment, you know, we have collection opportunities throughout the state. It doesn't matter what district you're in or what your town does or doesn't do for solid waste management provide that consistent, convenient opportunity. And that usually ends up with increasing the recycling or recovery rate of these materials. And then thirdly is providing financial relief. Right now, especially with recycling, it is costing um, taxpayers and swimmies, um, even more today, uh, for managing these materials. Um, and let me give you an example with um, electronic waste. So with, with e-waste, we have, um, you know, Vermont was the 23rd state. A lot of people think we were the first state. No, no, no. We were the 23rd state that came along and adopted an EPR program for electronic waste. And I think there's now 26 states that have some sort of e-waste program. They're different. There are different models out there that uh, approach it um, quite uniquely. Um, but with all of these models out there, with all these states participating, with manufacturers having to pay for 26 different programs in 26 different states, there is not a separate line item when you buy a computer or a TV. That cost of managing these materials is just included in the cost of that product. Just like other parts of the manufacturing, just like sourcing the materials to build it, just like the labor costs, just like their transportation costs, it's all part of buying that item. Just a question. I, I saw Best Buy and some of the retailers do have a cost now of fee to, to take the e waste product back. Is that right? If they are taking it back themselves, but are they charging that fee up front regardless of where the consumer takes that product? I, I don't know. I, was See, I think it's that way. So, I, you know, I think um, some, sto some retail stores are offering 
collection of the materials is not, sometimes it might be at no additional charge, sometimes they are charging more. With an EPR program, the cost of that product is a flat cost of that product for all the manufacturing costs, and the consumer has a no additional charge collection system available to them. That's a key part of EPR. Um, some states have EPR on, let's say, a product. Mm -hmm. So Vermont does not at the moment, let's say. And we are, are we, are Vermonters paying an embedded cost for that product that the manufacturer slash distributor um, has, has uh, included uh, because they have to do it in other states? That's a great question. Um, since I'm not privy to how manufacturers calculate that cost, and would that cost be incrementally higher if the other 24 states that don't have e-waste programs had e-waste programs? You know, would that be a higher cost? And, you know, I don't know, but I think the answer to your question, the simple answer is, yeah, we're, we're all paying for it. So we may as well have a program that helps us manage the materials. Thank you. Okay. Um, so who's involved? Um, this is a shared responsibility model. So yeah, the manufacturers and producers are involved, but um, um, so are others. Uh, retailers are generally involved because they can only sell products that are participating in, in, in the uh, program. And that is determined, usually the agency has a, a web-based list of those producers that are participating. And the agency has been really, at least in Vermont, clear in communicating to retailers when a participant drops out by issuing stop sale uh, letters. And we have not had to do that often. Just even having that in our toolbox is helpful in making sure that we continue to have participation. Um, consumers have responsibility that when they're done with using a product that they, you know, they take it responsibly to the appropriate collection location and have it managed. And government, you know, um, with, with our Vermont programs, uh, A&R has oversight of implementing the program, and our SWIMIs have been, our solid waste management entities, your districts, alliances, and independent towns have been really providing um, key convenient collection throughout the state and making sure that these products are appropriately managed. In house so, while we place you into your conference. We'll let her get connected. Okay, go ahead and I'll get it. Is Erin on? She's going to try it in, but she's been trying it. Thank you. Sorry about that. So moving on. So we have um, some key EPR programs in the state of Vermont. And like I said before, we have one on used electronics. We have mercury added products, that's the thermostats and the light bulbs, we call them lamps. Um, the picture in the, the lower um, middle picture, that's a switch in an automobile. Prior to 2003, automobiles had mercury containing switches. Uh, they're no longer used in the production of automobiles, but we had a program to collect those uh, primarily at our salvage yards. Um, we also have a program for um, architectural paint, that's basically latex and oil-based paints, and also on um, primary batteries, which uh, the stewardship organization expanded to also collect uh, rechargeables as well as cell phones. Um, like I said before, this is getting into our effectiveness that the swimmies and others help provide collection Convenient collection throughout the state. And so you'll see here if, uh, under each one of these programs that Vermont has obtained by having real, a really good collection network, uh, by having excellent outreach on our programs, letting consumers know about the programs, and having it at no additional cost that we get high participation. So those are the three key factors in making sure any program, whether it's EPR or not, successful. So with e-waste, you know, we had a dramatic increase in our electronics collection with the startup of the program, highest collection nationally, same with um, mercury lamps, 
And with the mercury lamps, thermostats, and auto switches, it's really important to see, demonstrate how much mercury that we're removing from the environment by having these collection programs. Um, same with, uh, with electronics, there are certainly heavy metals, uh, PCBs and other components um, that are important to remove, as well as to recover the valuable materials that can then be used to um, manufacture or produce new products. Primary batteries um, also had a dramatic increase, you know, 2,300%. Um, Another way of thinking of that is it's 23 times greater than it was prior to the program starting up. And then a kind of a tag along is our rechargeable battery collection, which was occurring voluntarily up until then, had a dramatic increase as well. Um, paint, we have the highest recovery of, of used paint or unused paint um, among all the state programs. And if you want to see graphs of these, um, here are three examples of how we had uh, an increase in the collection rate of our program. So with used electronics, you know, 2009 and 10, that's kind of like the base. Um, most women's offered collection of used electronics. Some of them charged for it. I know there were some consumers um, who felt like they paid a lot already for their electronics, so when it was needing to be recycled, they really kind of didn't like having to pay more to recycle something that they paid a lot for to begin with. My husband was among those. <laughs> um, so with these programs, though, we can unclutter our homes of these non-functioning or unused, um, no longer used products. And you know our collection rate you know, increased by threefold for electronics. And you see it's decreasing a little bit now. That's because um, the heavier capital gray tubes, the old TVs and, and computer monitors, we're getting through a, a majority of those. I won't say all of them, but we're starting to see a decrease there. Just like other states that started either before or at the time we did, they're starting to see a decrease in the, in the weight. This is all by weight, of course, in the pounds collected. With paint, it's the gallons collected. So we were collecting about 60,000 gallons. We have a huge network. Hopefully you're all aware of the network that our swimmies provide of the household hazardous waste events or their permanent facilities where you can periodically um, clean out your house of, of, of paint and uh, other has, uh, household hazardous waste and have them properly managed. So even with that good network throughout the state, we still had nearly a double doubling of the amount of being collected with an EPR program. Now, I think, again, there was a little bit of, um, I won't say hoarding, but keeping pent up latex paint that maybe wasn't as conveniently um, available for collection. Um, so that, there was a big slug of that at the beginning of the program, and now we're seeing that taper off a little bit, but still dramatically more than when prior to the program. And then I think one of the biggest changes we saw, maybe the color scheme isn't so great here, but there's a real sliver, a real tiny sliver of, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, a real tiny sliver of dark green at the bottom. That's the amount of primary batteries. How do I go back to where I was? So let me check in. Erin? Uh, Hi. Hi, you are on speakerphone it's in room 10. Welcome to the meeting, which is in progress. Yep. Great, thank you so much. Yep. Hi, Erin, this is Kathy Jameson. I'm providing a presentation on EPR programs in Vermont. So. Great, sorry to be late. Oh. Thank you for allowing me to call in. Um, so with battery collection, now primary batteries are the non-rechargeable batteries. Most people think of them as alkaline batteries. And so we had a dramatic increase where we were not collecting much at all prior to the program, and now we're collecting, it was over 60,000 pounds the first year, and then up to about 80,000 pounds the second year. And then with rechargeable batteries, we had an increase in the amount, that's the light green bar, in, in how, much the rechar how much we collected of rechargeable batteries. So again, we're showing that you know, this is a good example of volunteer programs. You know, Call the Recycle had a volunteer program of collecting rechargeable batteries for, for decades. Yet, when we have 
a, you know, an EPR program that's well advertised, that people are aware of, then we have increase in collection rates. So it's, a, and, and then likewise with electronics and paint, when we have the EPR program, we definitely have an increase in how we're collecting compared to voluntary programs. Yeah, I think I have a quick question about how these materials move around. So last time we were talking about the, the single sort stream, and then there's also like, depending on where you are, some, some places are sorting materials, recyclables, like glass by color or things that are tin cans, all the rest. Um, how are these materials being collected? Are, are any of these batteries, for instance, coming out of, or paint coming out of the single sort stream? Or is that by then? I don't know if they, okay, so someone first handles of all, it. We would not encourage anybody to put a battery or paint or electronics in your blue bin because that goes to the MERV and that would all only cause problems <laughs> with the MERV, right? Yes. So first of all, please don't put it in your blue bin. When you have these products, please um, go to a convenient separate collection. So these things all get collected separately. So um, you could you know, go to the website, go to your um, Swimmies webpage, and they have an A to Z guide. Every Swimmy has an A to Z guide. You type in the item you're trying to find a home for, and it will tell you the nearest location. Okay, great, thank you. I'm just thinking a little ahead to, if we move on to plastic packaging, of which there is a lot more volume, um, what's the, the way that these materials will be collected and flow, but we'll get there later. Right. Um, so again, um, those graphs demonstrated that we have an increase in the amount of materials collected. Um, EPF programs also save money um, when you think about how we're currently paying. And it maybe is shifting that cost to the actual consumer of the product so that it's true cost accounting. Mm -hmm. But with e-waste, for example, if you look at, we haven't closed out this year yet, so we don't have data for this year, but the seven and a half years prior um, to 2019, we had collected over 32 million pounds. Oops, I'm sorry. You mentioned it, maybe you'll get this, in terms of it says savings to taxpayers money over $10 million. Is that money that's returned to the taxpayer, or is that just put somewhere else in the I'll explain in a moment. Okay. okay. So, so we've collected over 32 million pounds in the seven and a half years of COVID. And if you, um, now remember, um, there was a charge that most women's charge for e-waste prior to the um, implementation of this EPF program. Sometimes it was $10 a computer or $20 a TV, depending on how big it was. Okay. What we did for looking at what's the savings here is we took that 32 million and just looking at only the collection and recycling costs of those materials, then that saves um, the taxpayer and swimming over $10 million. Now, that $10 million might have been embedded into the cost of those materials, which, um, you know, that might be a more acceptable way of managing the true cost of that product. So the cost of managing that product when the consumer's done with it is in that price already. It's already accounted for so that there isn't an additional charge, like a sticker shop charge, at the end of the life of the product. Does that help? Yeah, but you're saying it saves the, the solid waste district's money. And that's not going back to the taxpayer, though, right? Like the solid well, waste district isn't saying, we're no, you know, with packaging, they wouldn't say we're giving you back, you know, a portion of your property tax if that funds solid waste collection. Right? So, the, so, um, so some of the swimmies might have been subsidizing the cost of managing that material prior to the EPI program. Mm -hmm. So, we don't have a good, clear back, uh, breakdown of how much was being paid by the taxpayer and how much was being by, paid by the swimmie. But collectively, it's ten million dollars that's not being paid at the end of the life of these things, of just the Vermont Consumer Electronics. Okay, but packaging, we don't have that fee now, so that it's built in somewhere else, and it's not gonna be the same savings. Well, we haven't talked about packaging yet. I'm just talking okay. about right, trying waste. Trying to make comparisons, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and a clarification on, on savings to taxpayers. Um, if the swimming saves money, the taxpayer saves money. 
Thank you. Which I think is important for us to. Right, because the swimming only has so much money to manage materials. And so if it's going to cost more, that money has to come from somewhere. And, and they get their money through the members, the taxpayers in their district. So, you know, it's, it's ultimately Vermont. Any label you put on it. Managing electronics in Vermont prior to this program cost Vermonters money. And now, it's, it, the manufacturers are paying for it, and rightfully so, it's probably on the cost. It's a cost of that product, just like making this green costs X amount of money. Well, managing this material when it's done costs Y amount of money, and all of those things are factored in the, the cost of that product. So manufacturers as like a consortium or something like that pay in fee, or they, how does the state of Vermont get money? Thank you, great books? segue. There are different models. So, um, with our battery model, for instance, it is a stewardship organization that really takes care of all of that. And all the stewardship organization does with the state is submit a plan to the state on how they're going to do it. We verify that the plan meets the minimum requirements that are in the law. And then the stewardship organization, called the Recycle, interacts with all the battery manufacturers and has those battery manufacturers pay the stewardship organization for the collection of the batteries and then the recycling of the batteries and pay for the outreach of the program. That's one model. The e-waste model was a little bit different. In 2010, when we approached the e-waste manufacturers um, to have a similar system for the e-waste program, the manufacturers were quite adamant that they did not want to work together in implementing a program. And so the state was directed by the law to basically be the implementer of the program. So the state bills the manufacturers based on their market share. Their national market share prorated for Vermont uh, population by the weight of the materials they sell into the market for their cost of the program. And we have a contract for the collection and the recycling of the electronics. And so we, the state, are the implementer of the electronics program. I will say that that is a lot of work to put on the state agency, and our preference would be not to be basically playing the role of a stewardship organization. Okay. Moving. Oh, versus what other states have done? Do you know? Um, not exactly. Well, it, um, some, some states required each manufacturer to submit their own plan. That became problematic in those states in that, you know, you think about it, we, we have about 75 to 80 major manufacturers in our electronic waste program that we're, we're you know, connected with. That's a lot of different plans to keep track of. Those states basically had um, a target, each, each manufacturer had a target amount of pounds to collect, but they weren't necessarily required to collect throughout the state throughout the year. So if you're in uh, Minnesota, for instance, you might just set up in St. Paul, the Twin Cities, collect your pounds, and be done. That's great for St. Paul, but it's not great for the rest of the state. So with our program, our, hmm? New York is that way too. Right, and some of those states are considering modifying their state law because they're realizing that not all of their state is being served consistently. And, and the legislature at the time of the e-waste law, this, you know, they were very adamant that Vermonters, all Vermonters would have access to this program. So they said, we need a model where all Vermonters, it's not going to rely on what district you're in or what city you're in. And so that's why we have the model that we have for the convenience. And so to, it, it was basically modeled after um, Oregon and Washington have very similar models to Vermont. Moving on, so, so that's about um, information on our Vermont programs. And so the other charge that everybody really gave me was um, how would this work for single-use products? It's gonna be complicated to think about it because, you know, like I said with electronics, we, you know, we're dealing with maybe 75 leading manufacturers, batteries, it's about the same, you know, paint, I think might be up to about 100. You know, when you start thinking about packaging printed materials, there's a lot more players involved, right? So you get, that gets complicated. But the elements are the same. And so um, for this exercise of 
um, what we did was we said, okay, we looked at like our, our battery law. What are the basic elements? And then we know about some of the discussions going on in the country looking at EPR for packaging. So what are the considerations that this group should have in looking at EPR for packaging? And so um, we didn't say one way or the other how these considerations should go. We're just listing them. And so for ease, I mean, for the next six slides in the PowerPoint, it's this list, but to make it a little bit easier on folks, and we might want to refer to it later, that's up to the chair, but they're all on this one single page sheet because when I was first taught to go to the legislature, everything should be on one sheet, right? Uh, well, sometimes that's helpful. <laughs> okay. So, if I may. Please. Okay. So with, um, with any EPR program, it's really important to, with, with anything you do, race. What are you talking about? Okay, so what are the products that will be covered? We call those the covered products. Um, so with electronics, it was um, computers, monitors, because back in the day, monitors were separate from your computer. Um, TVs, um, CRTs, um, printers, and peripherals. Well, peripherals was it was covered to come back in, but we didn't capture all the manufacturers' peripherals because there were a lot more manufacturers of things that can plug in, like mice and whatnot, but they didn't weigh a lot. They didn't, you know, so yeah, we kept those separate. But what are you covering for products? And then, then you have to define producers and brands. Many of our um, EPI programs have broad definitions of those. And then, um, real important is who can bring the material back in. And so with um, um, single-use products, I'm assuming for the working group that the Act 69 definition of single-use products is what we're supposed to be looking at right now, for products. So as far as covered entities, this group um, would want to consider would a program for this cover residents and businesses. And the one thing with our collection system in the state, um, and every state's a little bit different in how they manage solid waste, but um, my understanding, and we have an expert here, but um, we can't easily tease out the amount of material that's collected by residences and businesses because some small businesses on the same route as residents for collection. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So that's a consideration for this group. Another consideration is the, um, the, the collection system that we have. Um, and it's real important um, to consider that it be at no additional charge to customers to get participation, just like our other EPR programs. And so with um, single-use products, or you know, some states are looking at just packaging, are just blue bin items, but in, in any event, when you're looking at this, how do you deal with existing infrastructure? And maybe I should have added in there existing haulers as well, because those are businesses. So how do you balance uh, the manufacturers or the producers wanting complete control for the system, because they're frankly paying for a good portion of it, um, versus how do we not strand investments that we already have and deal with the businesses that we currently have uh, for solid waste management in Vermont. So that's a real balancing thing, and that's something that this group would have to consider as far as collection. That's a quick question. So when you say at no additional cost to consumers, I think some people think that you're saying it's free. So it's not a separate paid transaction to recycle that item, but it, the cost of that recycling may be already built into the price of the good that you purchased. Right, so my father taught me that nothing is really free, that somebody somewhere is paying for it, and so, um, and then Kim has taught me that running trucks over the ground, over the roads, to collect things costs money. Um, so there is a cost to collecting recyclables. You know, the MRF, that costs money to operate. You have staff, you have equipment, you have O&M. Um, so all, it, having a recycling system is costly. So how do you pay for that? And so um, what people are looking at with an EPR program, 
you know, um, there's provinces in Canada. Is it fifty percent payment? Is it eighty percent payment? Is it one hundred percent payment? And what portion of the payment of that system of, of those providing those services should be paid for by the manufacturer? And so that would be a question for the group. Okay. Maybe it's a question for later. I mean, obviously live in a state that has deposits and just having gone through the deposit system, I know it's a different incentive, but are we missing an opportunity to educate the consumer about the need to manage this material differently with banning potentially some sort of fee that the consumer sees? Uh, just something I'd throw out there. I don't know if you've thought about that in these other programs on whether or not there would be a reason to have the ability for a fee or the deposit system or something along those lines. Being responsible for the oversight of Bob Bill, I would caution us in not creating a, a, a another separate recycling collection system for materials. Right now in Vermont, we have two collection systems. We've got our bottle bill material, and we have our blue bin system. Okay, to have a yet yeah, third or a fourth or a fifth would be very costly to Vermonters. Uh, the bottle bill is very, very, very successful, but it costs more per ton to recycle those materials in our blue bin system. So that said, there are other models out there, um, like you said, like a fee on packaging, that that fee goes into a pool and then somehow that pool gets divvied up. That is a separate model for sure. Um, but I would just caution but it could fit. about a bottle it, bill type. I mean, it can still be a stewardship, a extended police responsibility, it's just a different approach under the same goal, right? I mean. Yeah. So my understanding is that um, Item number five on our list of things to do is looking at, maybe it's four, four or five. One of them is, is to look at different methods. Right. Um, today I was just charged with walking through EPR. Yep. But you're right, that's, that's a model that some people are looking at right now. Oh, I, was, I was just gonna, when we were talking about the costs, just echo the point that Kathy made about when we're divorcing the cost from the manufacturer, that incentive to re-look at how you're developing the product in the first place, if you're offloading that cost uh, to taxpayers or other people are paying it and not the producer, then you're losing that opportunity to incentivize. So it <coughs> doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one cost right. if you're losing that. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna try to speed this up a little bit. So outreach and education, we've talked about that, how it's really important for any program. Um, stewardship organization, that's a nonprofit group usually that that works um, on behalf of all of the manufacturers. They develop the plan, they collect the materials, they're in charge of the recycling, and they maybe contract that out. Um, so with any EPR program, you should consider, do you just require one stewardship organization? Do you allow multiple options? Um, do you let manufacturers do, um, go it alone? You know, our e-waste law allows for uh, a manufacturer opt-out plan. Um, so that's, that's um, on the table for sure. Um, the plan is really key in the law as far as you know what is required by the manufacturers through their stewardship organization and how they need to, how they manage materials, uh, what kind of performance goals should they have, um, and what what happens, how do they implement the program to meet the performance goal, and. Um, Moving on, um, the producers. Um, this is getting at the payment part that we were talking about earlier. And so um, generally, with an, um, if you want a fee that um, helps incentivize the um, um, making less packaging, less toxic, um, easier to manage, more recyclable, the fee itself um, has to be such that it is different for each kind of category. So there's a term being used in the EPR world called modulating fees. And basically it means differing fees based on different um, categories. So you might get a bonus or less of, you know, less fee that you have to pay into if it's more recyclable, if it's a lighter material. You might pay more, though, if it's not recyclable, if it has to be landfill, etc. So there's a whole concept out there on modulating fees. Uh, Sorry, I have a question about modulating fees. Mm -hmm. Has that been done in, in the United States or Canada anywhere? Well, the United States does not yet have a state that has an EPR program for packaging, right? Yeah, yeah, but for e-waste or anything else, has there been modulated fees for 
easily. France has one. For, for and they have got, yeah, France um, has uh, adopted modulating fees, and they have data that shows that it has actually improved the uh, um, recyclability and the recycle content of these materials being sold in the marketplace. So modulating, modulating fees can be effective, um, and, and something that the group might want to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about embedded fees, that's where the fees um, Incorporated in the cost rather than a separate line item. Um, our um, e waste law allows um, national sales data to be used uh, to prorate um, um, based on our state population um, in order to ease, um, uh, make it an easy way to calculate what the market share might be. Um, and then um, most of our programs have an exemption for small producers based on either a number of products produced or perhaps on their sales. And then another key component is the responsibility of the stewardship organization. So remember, this is the group that's implementing the program on behalf of the manufacturers. And so, um, um, so lots of considerations here for the group. So, one is, um, and the state of Maine is looking at this right now, with their, and I'll get to what Maine's doing in a moment, but you know, how do you have the stewardship organization pay or reimburse for the cost of collection of these materials? And so, um, so is it, does the stewardship organization take responsibility for all the recycling, so then they just have to pay for it? Or if we have the existing system in place, is there a reimbursement of a portion of the cost. And so that's a consideration for any program. Um, State of Maine is also looking at a consideration of the payment of the portion of the waste stream that is disposed because as um, Representative McCullough pointed out, not all of this material goes through our recycle stream and, and still can't go through our recycle stream. So what happens to that? What's, what's the compensation that um, taxpayers get for that portion that still has to be disposed? Um, then, um, you know, the change in our marketplace, because what we've seen in some places, not in the United States, but in Canada and elsewhere, where the stewardship organization works with manufacturers to help develop additional or better recycling markets, because what's recyclable is really, it's dependent on the market, you know, and if there's a better market out there, then maybe we can collect more different materials that can then be recycled and used for input manufacturing new products. So that list at the beginning that I, I pulled directly from Act 69, A through E, one consideration is having the stewardship organization report annually on how well they're achieving those items. And then um, other items that we have, other components in, in the law that we um, add is um, the producer um, is prohibited from selling the product in the state if they're not participating. That's a key portion that you know to incentivize the producer to participate, um, and, and we've used that as a tool to gain um, compliance with the law with our other programs. Um, with um, EPR programs for for packaging, um, it's important to have performance goals, and, um, and that, those goals are probably going to be different for each kind of material type. So glass would be different from paper, which would be different from plastic number, whatever we're collecting. Um, and there needs to be um, some sort of consequence if the goal isn't met to incentivize um, continued um, performance in collecting these materials. Um, all of our programs require annual reporting um, to the state on how much they're collecting, where it went. Um, having an audit by third party is important, um, and what their plans are for the upcoming year. Um, to allow um, manufacturers to work together with this stewardship organization, uh, you'll see an antitrust uh, condition in our laws, and that's because um, this, the manufacturers um, didn't want to be pursued for antitrust issues if um, they're working together on implementing this program. So that's that's that issue, um, or that's that's why that component's included. 
Um, there are fees that are associated with this. One is paid to ANR for our oversight, and then the law usually de defines what ANR's oversight is. Generally, it includes you know we review and approve if it's acceptable to plan. We do annual reviews of their um, reports, uh, their performance goals. Um, we have enforcement, and that can be making sure that the producers who are supposed to be um, are participating, are participating, et cetera. Um, with data being submitted to the state, um, we have to have make sure that any confidential business information is um, kept confidential. And of course, we have to have a, a schedule for implementing the program. Um, so there are other states. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Um, uh, roughly five more minutes. Okay. So you can hear from others about how there's a multiple of EPR programs throughout the United States for all kinds of programs or products. Um, right now, there are several states that are looking at, similar to how we're looking at, EPR for either plastic packaging or all packaging or single-use packaging. Um, I think the states to watch right now are Maine, Washington, and California. And real quick, um, Maine already had EPR framework legislation that requires their DEP report annually to the state. And as part of that, in the legislature, um, with their discussion with Maine DEP, the legislature has to resolve requiring their DEP to come back for, for this um, 2020 <coughs> session with proposed legislation for an EPR law for packaging. So Maine's DEP is working on that right now. And the resolve required that the proposal has to include a stewardship organization, that the producer fees are basically modulated, um, that the producer fees pay for 80% of the cost of recycling and a portion of the disposal of the non-recyclable material, and that it funds education and outreach. So stay tuned. Um, we are in touch with Maine, and um, so we're looking forward to hearing from them when they have a, a public document. They did have a model, conceptual model, that they released a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's not proposed legislation. Uh, Washington State had um, slightly different legislation. They're taking a little bit longer point of view, but their goal is by um, 2022 to have uh, better management in place for plastic packaging. So they're requiring the state to hire a third-party consultant to evaluate plastic packaging and report back in about a year from now. And that report has to show how they're going to achieve 100% um, for, or, let me back up, that plastic packaging has to be 100% either recyclable, reusable, or compostable by January 2025. And that, that packaging also has to have 20% post-consumer recycled content. They also need to try to reduce, like we said, that's the best benefit of when you reduce it and identify costs. So they're another state to watch. Is the post consumer recycled content requirement a uh, way of trying to drive the marketplace to create other uses for the material? Right. And, and, it, and it helps provide an incentive to collect it if you have to incorporate it into manufacturing the products. Um, California has a lot of activity going on. So they had um, both a, an assembly and Senate bill, but the same bill. It was, um, they called it the Circular Economy Bill. Um, it would require their state to adopt rules so that, um, that all um, um, packaging or single-use products would be recyclable or compostable by 2030, allowing a little bit more time than Washington. However, it would also mandate a 75% reduction in the waste it basically was being disposed from these single-use products. Um, that bill has not passed. Um, my understanding is that they just finished year one of a two-year biennium. So I think that that bill is still live and can you know, come back into discussion in January. Meanwhile, though, they, did, they just passed two separate bills. And one is that for businesses that are required to recycle or compost, then they need to provide the same services to their customers. 
Uh, so, for instance, if you're um, a restaurant and you compost and recycle, well, the restaurant's not a good idea, uh, maybe a, a mini mart or something that has um, recycling of the materials in the back end, they have to make sure that if there's a trash can that there's a recycling can in the front end. But more importantly, more importantly is the post-consumer part of this, and they, they pass a separate bill for, this is just their bottle bill plastic. Has to be 10% recycled content by 2021 and 50% by 2030. So that's just, in my understanding, bottle bill plastic containers. So, so that's that. That's kind of the state of the state, what's happening at a very high level. Um, and I think that kind of sets the table for some other presentations you might hear today. Um. Similar to the auto emissions California program, there have been multiple states, Vermont being one, who have adopted the California standard. Um, is it too early it, um, for states to have considered or have any adopted the California standard, if you will, on uh, Bill 792? Oh, I just closed that up. That's, is that the bottle? Yes. Okay. You know, I think Cal's, they, they're a real driver and manufacturing um, of materials. And maybe someone from the marketplace can tell us if that's going to drive, you know, Coca-Cola, Pepsi. It's you know. the first bill in the country to pass. It just passed a week ago. Oh, right. oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, quick question. So thank you for uh, putting this together for all of us. Um, when you think about Maine and Vermont and even Washington having this kind of a conversation, um, how does how do you think about the possibilities to move forward when we are we're not California, so we're not 40 million people. So are you imagining that there's ways that states are going to be able to make steps independently, or as groups of states, or how, what are you thinking might happen? For instance, New England, mm -hmm. Vermont. You, you know, that's a great question. Um, wouldn't it be ideal? if everyone could pass the same law. The, the, the challenge with that is our solid waste systems are not the same. You know, um, for instance, like Massachusetts, um, they, my understanding is um, curbside collection of both trash and recyclables for residents is pretty much done by the municipality. Like, the municipality contracts that out. But we don't have all that um, subscription service that Vermont has, and what I mean by that is that you know in Vermont you generally call a private hauler up to come to your home and pick it up. So you have various haulers. You know, I think it's probably easier to implement in a state where the municipality has one contractor providing that service. We have multiple businesses providing services in our municipalities. For most of our, our municipalities. And that's that I think is going to be a, a different challenge for us to think about. You know, Maine, we've been having discussions with them because they're, they're leading the charge. Um, one of the ones leading the charge. And my understanding is that municipalities in Maine are required ultimately for um, trash uh, and recycle management. So they all have transfer stations. So there's municipally owned facilities. So that's why when you look at Maine law and you look at their conceptual model, it's municipal reimbursement because municipalities have a real cost here. We, you know, um, yes, we do have some municipal transfer stations in Vermont, but we also have privately owned ones. And so we have a, we have a different variety of players um, touching, managing um, these materials. And I think we should be conscious of that when considering any of these models. Any questions for Kathy before we go on? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the CEO and founder of the Product Stewardship Institute, coming up from Boston. Beautiful drive uh, here today, seeing the leaves um, change. Uh, the, I just want to start by kind of answering your last question, and then I'll back up. 
in terms of models, that's really the way to think about our organization is that we've developed models for extended producer responsibility across the country. And in, in terms of packaging, while, um, and, and let me just say, it's great to come um, after such a great presentation on EPR, I'm usually the one, you know, kicking it off and breaking uh, the ice on things. So thank you for, for your presentation, Kathy. Um, so what we do is we, we try to find the commonalities um, among the different states. We work with 47 states and, uh, and lots of hundreds of local governments on this, and I'll get into that more. But what we try to do is to develop models because that's really what industry wants. It's more fair to them, it's less expensive, and governments share with each other, but they don't always know the best practices. So that's where we're coming from. So I'm going to also... I know that uh, you're just getting these slides. Uh, we have up here the, the um, you know, behind me, so I'm going to keep going back and forth so you can, you can follow me. Uh, since I'm, I'm not known in Vermont, I thought I'd put together you know, who I am. I've been working in the waste field for 35 years. Uh, I founded the Product Stewardship Institute with many, many uh, people 20 years ago. Um, been working on packaging EPR for about 15 years. Right now, uh, I was on and pointed to uh, the Connecticut Legislative Packaging Task Force, which I think is similar to what you're doing here, um, and went through that process two years ago. Uh, I'm also the president of the Global Product Stewardship Council. We share information globally. Uh, and for seven years, I was the Waste Policy Director in Massachusetts, um, liaison with the Governor's Office and all of our departments on waste hazardous and solid waste issues. Uh, I come from this from a dispute resolution perspective, um, matching the, the technical with facilitation and mediation. And that's how we've developed um, these EPR models. So the ones that you have here uh, in Vermont, um, our organization developed with, um, with, with Jen Holliday, with John Letty, with Kathy Jamison, and others here. We bring together the experts and all over the country to develop these different models. So our organization, um, we're based in Boston. We have uh, 47 state members, hundreds of local government members. We also have uh, 120 different partners, mostly businesses, but also uh, university uh, representative <coughs> universities, um, uh, organizations including environmental groups and non-US governments, so particularly those in Canada and Europe that work on product stewardship. We have an advisory council, business and academic, um, global product stewardship council as I mentioned before, and then we've also um, helped to start um, to, to found or co-found a number of product stewardship councils including the one here in Vermont that Jen Holliday is the chair of and John Levy is also an active member in. So we work very closely with those in Vermont. I think every solid waste district is a member of our organization and works uh, on the Vermont Product Stewardship Council. Um, here is just another diagram to amplify what, uh, what Kathy had mentioned about product stewardship. That term is one that we defined a number of years ago with a couple of other organizations to get on the same page. Product stewardship is the big circle here, meaning it can be voluntary, or it can be mandatory. So if you follow the upper end, it could be producer responsibility, like the Thermostat Recycling Corporation all over the country. Here it's mandatory, but it's voluntary in other parts of the country. Batteries is mandatory here. Rechargeable batteries, it's voluntary all over the country. Industry voluntarily uh, taking responsibility. That is part of product stewardship. Um, it can also be government regulatory programs acting on their own if government, say, limits the mercury in a product like it did in the Northeast and here in Vermont on mercury thermostats or thermometers or other things, it's taking action. So those are all under the product stewardship umbrella, but EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, is really a mandated end-of-life um, aspect in what we think of as take back. So it's a take back of the product, and as Kathy said, we're extending the producer's responsibility from the typical in the manufacturing plant, where you're responsible for you know, air emissions, water, land, worker safety, extending that all the way to the end of life management of the product. So they're responsible for it even in the back end. And the idea is if they're responsible, they own that product and problem, if you will, or material, 
then they're going to think about what they put into that problem, that product upstream. So they're not going to put materials in that are toxic or, or costly in the back end because they'll have to deal with it. And they'll make that calculation. So it's a connection that's very important. Uh, so just as a big picture, trends from 2000 to 2019, 118 products by EPR laws have passed in the United States. Uh, you can see here, uh, Vermont uh, is, uh, in, is, is red in color and has eight of these laws. They're second only to California with nine. Maine has seven. Um, and uh, there are 118 laws passed uh, on 14 different products in 33 states. So it's fairly extensive across the country. These are some of the products here, starting with mattresses, lamps, paint, uh, medical sharps, batteries, thermostats, electronics, and pharmaceuticals, five state and 23 local on pharmaceuticals. Uh, as, as Kathy mentioned, zero on packaging so far. So that's an important thing. So this Can I ask is just a quick question on the uh, experience around these other products that already have been regulated for a while. Um, often people, are, the discussion of finance always comes up pretty quickly and people say, uh, will this cost me more or will this cost me less in the end, you know, than not building in the cost up front, for instance. So can you say something about the economic experience that, that you see in terms of when there's EPR, the overall costs, however this divided, This isn't too improving. dizzy. What I'll do is go right to the end. This is like the saver slide. Um, but as you'll see, there are there's two types of financing systems for extended producer responsibility. Uh, what we're talking about for packaging, for the most part, is on the left side. Um, and you have here the electronics and the thermostats and batteries that are cost internalization model. I'll talk more about that. And in that way, you don't see any increase in costs. If there is, it's spread over. If the, the, that financing system gives more flexibility to the manufacturer. Basically, it says you have these responsibilities. You have to figure out the cost, and, and the responsibilities could mean to recycle a certain amount of that material you put into the waste stream or you put onto the market. You have to take that back. You have to figure out the system. You have to educate consumers. You have to have the administration, all that. You figure out how to do that. You can add cost if you need to to all the products in your region, in your country, whatever, or you could reduce your costs somehow. We don't care as a government. It's up to you to figure that out. The three models, the three, the, the eco fee model on the right hand side here, there's only three of those. It's paint, you have that here, and mattresses and carpet, where there's three laws on mattresses and one on carpet. And those are the eco fee model, like paint, it's, what's it now? It's not 75 cents, it went up to 90? 99. 99 cents. 99 yeah. cents a gallon on the paint case. So the consumer there pays more. I, I'd say the missing discussion on cost here so far, um, and it's hard to calculate, of course, is the externalities of the environment, right? We, we're trying to incorporate those externalities, and there's a cost to preventing those externalities from happening. There's also a benefit that's hard to calculate, but it's in jobs and economic development and you know, material use. You know, we just came back from uh, Colorado last week and we announced the creation of the International Paint Recycling Association, which Chittenden County is a member, one of the two government members. And these are businesses that have formed and expanded over the, over the United States because there's a supply of paint that's being created by these EPR programs. They're, they're creating jobs, there's economic value, and so it's not only you know, creating the, the market, as you, as you mentioned, for, for the material, but it's creating some positive um, you know, financial benefits. So there's financial costs that are covered, but there's financial benefits, and then there's the externalities not created. And those are tough to calculate, but I just wanted to put that into the mix here. Thank you. Um, you heard me ask the, the question earlier in the, in the afternoon. This is regarding um, Again, your last slide, the, the, the internalized costs of products, that's one way um, EPR is done. Are, are, 
our, our uh, Vermonters or other state residents paying an internalized cost for a product that they do not have in their state an EPR on, but manufacturers have embedded it in their list. So there's no, there's no, I don't know how we can figure that out, but there's no evidence that I've seen. I mean, it might be happening, but I think it's more, it's broader than that over the United States, let's say. It would be imperceptible. Like, it's not happening on a state by state or even a regional basis. No. I think that would be something that the producers can address better, better than I could. And in Canada, when, where we've worked across the state with those from packaging, one of the representatives from Unilever who is supportive of and works in the EPR for packaging systems has said that there's not that change. Now it could be because the market in Canada is smaller and the United States market's bigger, but it's it's not it has not been brought up as a major concern that one state or one region is paying more for this. And as a matter of fact, I don't want to get too much into it, but the Pharmaceutical take back, the pharmaceutical industry sued, um, brought a case to the U.S. Supreme Court on that basis, saying that there's a commerce clause, that, that California's law was putting externalities and, and raising costs in other places and they don't get the service. And so the Supreme Court said they're not going to hear that case. It went back to the Ninth Circuit and it, they let that EPR program stand. So that's as far as that argument has gone, okay. as far as I know, but there may be others that know more than I on this issue. Thank you. So, why is EPR growing um, in the U.S. and globally? Um, the ground has been plowed. Um, we're, we've been doing it for 20 years, and this is the wider we. Um, you know, lots of people in the United States, but globally, it's been uh, for for a long time, over 35 years. I mean, this, we've imported this concept from from Europe and. Canada imported from Europe as well. Uh, so it works. There's sustainable funding for programs. There's, um, there's uh, savings for governments, as, as Kathy was saying. There's financial benefits. Some of it is direct. You know, if, if you spend, uh, you know, if you're spending on paint, uh, you know, a million dollars on paint, uh, but you really need to spend five million, and then the program comes in and there's five million of benefits, so it's one million of direct financial savings and five million of benefits. I mean, that's a, it's kind of getting to Andy's question here. Um, education and infrastructure, there, there's more convenience for consumers, increased recovery, you see it for all different products and even for packaging. There's more jobs, uh, we've, we have calculated 200 jobs for the paint program alone, and that was about three years ago, so there are actual jobs here being created. Um, improved efficiency and then better products. Not on every single um, product, but and not in every instance, but there is there are design influences. Um, you know, more for packaging than say electronics, less for paint than you know some other different product. So this isn't just a statement, this is really a fact. Um, EPR is the centerpiece for the circular economy when it comes to Europe. Europe is mandated. They have, uh, you know, they, they come out in front and they've mandated EPR um, as the centerpiece for the circular economy they, by law. The, the 28 member nations, they have that as their directive. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the way we look at it here in the United States. And globally, here's, you can see the same slope as I showed you in the United States. It's happening globally. And this is five years old. It's from the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, we work closely with. And you can see that the number of EPR programs has really risen worldwide. We're about a third of those. Uh, caution here is that they have a different definition than we do, um, but it's very much, you know, similar and overlapping in many ways. The next slide shows you that packaging is the second most prevalent program um, in the world, or maybe tied with tires, if you will. The tires are more fees, and packaging is really true EPR. We don't consider advanced disposal fees as EPR in our definition, but they do globally. So electronics, number one, but packaging um, is, is number two. And this is the, this is, 
pretty, maybe startling. Um, but, but in 2000, you can see, that's the part to the left, it just some countries in Europe had EPR for packaging. Um, and this is the light blue. Um, and on the right hand side, you see it's EPR for packaging in 2019. And this is all throughout Canada, all throughout Europe. Um, and there are, um, yeah, there's uh, Soviet Union, Russia has this. Um, and then in the yellow are those in implementation, uh, China um, and India. Mm -hmm. And you have um, the dark blue is also EPR in implementation at the country level. You have Brazil, and I was just in Chile recently, and that's in implementation too. This is all over the world. Israel has the program, you know, many, many countries. We do not in the United States, zero. Uh, we're one of only a few OECD nations that do not have EPR for packaging. It's, we're kind of following the trajectory of what we do in climate change, but we're going to change that, right? All right. So the next slide um, is a uh, is a, uh, a slide just showing where the U.S. fits. This is from a producer organization in Europe. Uh, the red is the U.S. fitting it in. We're between Latvia and uh, Romania, I think, um, and other. This is just packaging. It does not have printed paper to it, but uh, taking out, just showing you that we're we're not doing well compared to others. I'm just going to pause here and move into a different direction unless there's questions. Okay. So, oh yes. So, um, just seeing this, you know exponential curve of the growth of EPR policies and then we're simultaneously seeing these like massive increase in plastics and packaging just could you speak a little to is it like these haven't had time to go into effect to drive down those global trends or are we not doing the right things or just just kind of that disconnect them yeah that's a good question I think it's that um, a lot of the, the plastics is coming from nations that don't have systems in place EPR systems or bans or fees I mean what you put in place here are what other country like India as well uh, you know I was over there a couple of years ago and they're struggling with putting these programs in place they have a big informal sector uh, they're, they're a lot of plastics coming from there and into the, the gyres, into the oceans. So yes, I think that's it. We're in the beginning of that. And so EPR is one of the, um, the solutions. It's not the only solution. Sometimes you want to ban things, which we've done here in Vermont on um, certain items. So there's, there's various approaches, and it just has not caught up to the problem yet. So, I, I have here a dialogue process, and this is really what we do at the heart of the organization. We do a lot of research. We bring, you know, the experts that are called the brain trust together. We have the government brain trust and, and those in the industry to solve the problems. Um, and you need to have all these different problems. That's my training in mediation is that it can't be directed. Uh, and so we've developed this process where you go through what's the problem. Everyone needs to agree on it. If you don't agree on the problem, you can't go to what's the goals that you're trying to achieve. If you don't figure out the goals, you can't figure out then what's the barriers to achieving those goals, and then you can't start to talk about solutions. If you rush to the solutions without figuring out the other things, you're putting the cart before the horse. And so this is the process that we've used for over 20 different products for the United States and has worked in, in various ways here for, for the different product categories. So starting with the problem, and this is you know, a, a slide I've used for probably at least 10 years um, or more, and I'll use it again, it's good recycling, um, or reuse, uh, is that the system, the, the recycling is stagnant. It has been for about a decade. It just ticks up a little bit, but we're at a, we're at a, you know, a, a, a straight line um, here in terms of recycling in the United States. I'm not talking just Vermont. And you, are a leader in so many ways, so I want to hesitate. You know, I don't know where you are with the, with the, uh, you know, the average. I know you're hurting on the packaging like everyone else. Um, it's fragmented. So for packaging, uh, you know, each city, county, uh, jurisdiction is collecting a different uh, set of materials, and they're educating 
on different ways. And there's a there's a a potpourri, if you will, a fragmented system. It's underfunded. You know, we all know that government is stretched on so many matters. Um, it's based upon an annual appropriation. It's not reliable. It's underfunded. We work quite a bit in Connecticut. They have calculated $30 million for their recycling. That's the cost. I just heard yesterday we were talking to uh, Maine. It's about half that amount, maybe 15, 17 million in Maine. And we don't have a number for Vermont, but you can see it's big dollars. And those are costs that taxpayers and governments pay. Um, and of course, there's difficult markets. And if there's a problem, it all falls back on government. So this is where, you know, this is I think why you're here, it's, it, it's who pays. And I think around the country that governments are finally saying, why are we paying for this? Why are we paying no matter what happens? The markets go out in China, our costs go up, everything gets passed on to us. We have no control over the system. We have to pay it or stop our recycling program. It's, it's, you know, and it's coming to a crisis right now, so Crises are good for these kind of things, and this is an opportunity to really change the system, to make the fundamental changes that we've all been talking about here for 15 years, that Europe's already put them in place for 35 years. Those programs, many of them in Europe, are in place for EPR for packaging for 30, 35 years. That is crazy, but that's the case. So we have an opportunity. There's no incentive for, oh, Andy, yes. One question, we saw the European rates were 80%. They include waste energy in their calculation of conversion rates, correct? I asked that question, and the answer I got from Joachim Coden, who runs that expert, is no. Okay. And that does not count as recycling, okay. or recovery. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I, I, I was curious myself, but the answer was no. Uh, so there's no incentive really for manufacturers to change their product design or to reduce the impact unless it lowers the cost for them. I mean, that's what manufacturers should be doing. They should be lowering the cost and, you know, lighter weight electronics, as Kathy was saying, the electronics are getting lighter. Um, and that's all a good thing in the manufacturer. That's why the driver there for electronics is more about the lightweight. Um, but there's, there's less incentive if it's not for that. You're not gonna do it because there's more costs on government. So this is where I put a question mark. What are Vermont's goals for recycling reform? And this is where, you know, as a mediator, or you know, consensus builder, we, we, I can tell you what we're hearing from other, other states and jurisdictions. So this is, take that in that vein. It's not me saying what it should be or, you know, what it is, but, you know, some of it is in the definition of EP, our definition of EPR. This is for the group or Vermont, this, this working group or, or uh, the legislature to figure out, A and R, uh, to figure out. But one goal would be to shift the costs from taxpayer-funded government programs to the producers and consumers, either fully or, or partially. Uh, reducing waste, increased reuse and recycling is probably the no-brainer. We all want that. Uh, maximizing material value. So to reduce contamination, there's things to do to reduce contamination. Some of those are, uh, would be stipulations, requirements on governments. You know, uh, to, we'll, we'll pay you, you know, this much if it's clean, but we'll only pay you this much if it's, you know, doesn't have that quality. So you're, you actually have a, a lever in there, but material value, creating recycling jobs, um, and then getting incentives for the manufacturers, uh, you know, pro and con incentives for them to make more sustainable products. So how do, what are the objectives? Um, so cost internalization could be one, rather than the eco fee, for example. Uh, producers paying the cost to recycle what they put on the market. A cohesive system that melds with your laws and regulations, I think that's also one most states want, cohesiveness. And then there's this differential fees or eco-modulated fees, which Kathy brought up, um, to create an incentive for the use of material that costs less to recycle, um, has less impact on the environment. And so I want to go into that a little bit more. Um, I do have uh, some slides here that I got from others around the country. So this is really the leading edge, if you will. And thank you again, Kathy, for, for laying that out on the groundwork for me. 
So the eco-modulated fees, they're set by weight. Um, it's one basic way. So if you have a, a unit of measurement on, uh, you know, on uh, it, weight is the, is the unit of measurement. So if you have less material to make your product, then more material. If it's less material, then you'll be charged less because it's less weight. It also can be set by the type of material that would reflect environmental costs. So for example, recycled content. So if you have low recycled content, you're not creating that market pull, then you'll charge more. Or another way to say it is if it's high recycled content, you get a bonus and you'll be charged less. Um, and these systems are being revised in Europe and Canada um, to reflect now the true cost of managing materials and to incentivize eco-design choices. And this is saying, this is, a, this is one of the most rapidly developing areas um, globally. And you know, Andy, your question was, is it happening here in the US on other products? It's starting to be discussed for them, but I think that the leading, the concept is leading on packaging. There's most um, uh, experience in that, and that's coming globally. So I have a couple of examples here. One is uh, the British Columbia um, program. And if you, if you see this slide, I circled the red. Um, so within the category of plastics, PET containers, for example, would be, and I need to put my glasses on here, uh, you know, 53 cents per kilogram. Um, but the same weight for plastic laminates, because laminates is less desirable, would be double that. Okay? So the cost for the plastic laminates would be more. Now it's not telling the producers to, you can do this or you can't do that. It's not banning laminates. It's saying if you want to use laminates, it's such a such a problem that you're gonna we're gonna charge you twice as much. Okay, so that's what the producers have come up with in British Columbia. This is from the producers themselves, and I'll explain that. Kathy mentioned the stewardship organization. That's where all the well, the, the figuring out of the costs and how to assign these costs come, comes about. Um, but the producers basically assign themselves these, these costs. Um, now in France, uh, this program here, um, yeah, it's run by a stewardship organization called Scipio, and they currently only have one EPR uh, fee for all plastics, but beginning in 2020, uh, there will be seven categories. Uh, for plastic packaging to reflect the level of development of recycling facilities there. Um, and this is where life cycle analysis, if I can say, it can be changed by putting in infrastructure and changing the calculation of the benefits by, uh, by putting in, say, for, for example, infrastructure. So here, just look at the top line, a bottle and a vial in a clear PET versus the packaging containing PVC. And you can see that there's an incentive for the clear PET and a disincentive for the PVC containing plastic. Um, on, the, on that model from France, does it also include, is that life cycle analysis include public health externalities, you know, where the plastics can reach uh, toxic chemicals or toxic chemicals can be involved in their manufacture and stuff like that. So do they get into that side? They, they will. Let me just say they will. Um, I don't know particularly if France does that. If they're just moving, if they have one fee now and they're moving to this, it looks like they're not there yet. But say the Canadian programs, they're run by uh, an organization that coordinates all the stewardship organization and they put out a study to look at how, where we can push the envelope on life cycle, mm -hmm. looking at you know the toxics or other impacts. And as we know, life cycle analysis is very complicated, very costly, and you know to get further than it depends, you know we need to, which is <laughs> I've had my experience with, with life cycle analysis. Um, it's important to think that way. How we can bring it down to this, we need to do that, and that is even beyond what I see as the cutting edge now, but it, it is, there, people are thinking about that and that is where we need to get to. Okay. So here's the Netherlands. Um, and so starting January 1, 2019, a lower rate uh, will apply to plastic goods that can be sorted and recycled 
with a positive market value. So you can see the various rates. These are also called differential fees because there's different fees. Non-recyclable plastics is higher than an easily recyclable plastic. And then they even define you know, what's recyclable. Of course, that needs to be defined and you know, made from the type of plastic that is collected, has a market value, and or supported by a legally mandated program, et cetera, et cetera. So there are specifications here. This is the goalpost. It's, it's having it clear to the producers what, like, what, how to play the game. It's clear to them and let them compete into this game, but the game is getting more sophisticated. And the, the eco-modulated fees are more sophisticated. And I'm not going to go over this slide. Yes. Another question over yeah, just oh, question. So the British Columbia, the fees are set by the PRO, France and the Netherlands, it's set by the government, or who says those? No, fees? those are set by the, the PROs. In well. one institute. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's, there's different ways to, to do this, um, and it gets down to the level of prescriptiveness that a government wants, and we see this all over the United States. Uh, some want everything in the legislation themselves because you know they want it all spelled out and their experience with the producers or with others is that if it's not in the legislation, then the producer's going to argue about it and there could be a lawsuit or there's uncertainty <laughs> involved, so they want everything in the legislation. There's others that say, okay, we'll let the producers propose that to us, and in this case, the us would be the government oversight agency, let's say A&R, and it would, it would shift the responsibility to the administrative agency. And so they would get a proposal from uh, the producers, let's say, that would say, okay, here's what we propose for our modulated fees, and then the, you know, the, the legislation would say, you have to have modulated fees, and there might be some stipulations in it, but it would allow the industry the flexibility to propose that to a &R, and they would review it and either prove it, disprove it, ask for more um, of it, so it gives them the authority. Um, so those are two of the elements that we see, but you, you know, the producers are very much involved in that because it's their programs, and you know, the one that's doing the good stuff and having environmentally uh, preferable materials in their product, they want to get the advantage. They, they want all their R&D to pay off, as it should. Um, can I add a quick question on how those the proceeds, so the government or an entities collecting those fees, do the producers typically have any kind of uh, influence over how those dollars are expended, for instance, might they be drawn to using a particular kind of material if government invested in infrastructure that would create a higher level of recyclability of that material so that it would be a, a more optimized system? Or do they just yeah. pay in more and where the money goes, who knows? Well, I will say that we're just about to start a discussion with the Flexible Packaging Association. Um, and it's one of their questions that they'd like to bring to the table, which is, um, whether uh, the, the EPR system, and they would like to see the EPR system, the funds that are created, um, have some amount of funding go into R&D for flexible packaging, flexible package recycling. And so that I'll, we'll put on the table to the governments and they'll, you know, and they'll see. Now I think R&D in the paint program, it's happening in the three states that have surpluses on the paint fee, and the fee is different than cost internalization. Um, here, I know you've had a, a deficit, and hopefully it's you know more more along the line. That's why the fee is raised. But in three states, there's there's a, and, and it's because you're doing such a great job uh, here <laughs> collecting the paint. I think it, um, it's why that they didn't get it right the paint here. But um, but you have three states where they used funding from those states for. Spending $100,000 in each of the states for R&D into non-paint that is recyclable but is not good enough to go into recycled paint. For example, you could use that to make adhesives or soft rocks, they call them, or some you know some kind of other recycled paint products. So that's that is a precedent for using some funding from that pot for R&D that would then create more markets and solve an overarching problem. Thank you. So
So here's the last example of the eco-modulated fees, and I know I spent a lot of time on it, but I think this is an important concept. Um, I'm not going to go over this, but uh, you, you can look at it another time. But Germany, Sweden, and Italy are also moving in this direction um, as well to put in place eco-modulated fees. Europe does not mandate it happen exactly the same way. The member states have jurisdiction to implement it, but they do say, and it is mandated, that they all have to have modulated fees. So back to the questions, um, you know, here's some things to consider if you want to have as one of the objectives in the use of existing recycling and solid waste infrastructure. You want all municipalities to collect the same materials and have consistent messaging, same messaging, or like paint care has the same messaging all across the country, saves, saves money, there's, there's a benefit to that. Do you want to have full producer payments into the system? Um, usually if, if there's full producer payments, the producers want more control, that's kind of the, the, the tug um, here in the negotiations. Always have government oversight. Um, the concept of, of a multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder advisory committee um, is here. Uh, you know, there's, there's a big question of governance. So these producer responsibility organizations um, are, are just producers. But you could have in that group, the legislatures could say, well, we're going to have a member of a &R. we're going to have a local government representative, an environmental group representative on the board to have that voice right in there. Or it could be multi-stakeholder advisory to that producer responsibility organization. So governance is a very big issue um, globally. And you see here the carpet program is, is getting a lot of uh, the carpet manufacturers and the stewardship organization they have developed is not working well. And there's people that want to take that control completely away from the producers. So if they don't do a good job, then they're on the hook and they'll, they'll be behind the eight ball. So there's an incentive for the producers to do a good job, but how does government ensure that that happens, what oversight? And there's a number of different models for that to consider. Can I ask a quick question just so I make sure I understand the term? Full producer payment in the system. So they're paying into every step of the entire system, but are they covering, does that also imply they're paying 100% of the costs for all that? Or? That would be 100%, but it would be globally. So it wouldn't be just paying on collection and paying on processing, like separate, mm -hmm. they would figure out what's the cost of the system that government's telling me I need to produce. I need to reach 60% recycling of this material by this date. Mm -hmm. What's the cost going to be in the infrastructure and education and administration for doing that? And also paying government oversight, let's not forget that, that that's part of the program, government oversight. Before. So all that together comes into a cost, and that's what the producer responsibility organization figures out, how to apportion that to their different producers that pay into that fund. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna go down here, uh, just the different paths um, briefly. This is a main fork in the road um, that we've seen here for our, our members. Um, is do you, you know, these are archetypal, becoming archetypal programs. Do you want either the British Columbia model, because British Columbia, Canada, or do you want the Quebec model? And so, and there could be a hybrid somewhere in here. So I'm just laying these out as options. What, what people mean by British Columbia is that the brand owners are responsible for financing and managing the recycling. And municipalities from the PRO are given some options. They say, look, you can turn your recycling system over to us, we'll pick it up, and that's it, we'll, we'll take that over. You know, you don't wanna buy new trucks, you don't, you, maybe you never did it before, look, we'll take it over. You could also um, be under contract. You as a municipality could be under contract to us, PRO, um, to recycle. Now what they do is they put a number on the table and they say, we've calculated you know, what the optimal cost should be, we're gonna pay you X. And that municipality will make that decision if they want X, they negotiate a little bit, but they seal the deal and they'll say, okay, I'll have a contract with, with the PRO. 
A third could be the municipality says, look, we love our system, we market our materials, we're doing great, you know, you guys do what you want, we'll continue, and you can do that as well. So there's options. The Quebec system, the producers are responsible for financing the recycling, but the municipalities actually are responsible for managing the recycling, and they get reimbursed by the brand owner. So this is where um, there could be more of the patchwork, if you will, um, if it's developed that way. So, you know, let's say I, I have my... Um, Uh, so, so let's say each of the municipalities has different systems. They like it. They uh, they like where they're going. You know, and they, some of them have their own MRF, public MRF. Some of them go to you know they know where they're going in the private MRF. They want to keep that system, but they want to get reimbursed for it. So this is more of a, a reimbursement model, less disruptive for the existing situation. Might not be optimal for some of the other things depending upon what you want, but less disruptive. And then there's the hybrid somewhere in. So, and I don't know really answer this question. So, does Quebec have 100% because they're uh, manufacturing financing under the program? Yes, it's moved from 50% over the years to 100% producer financing. And when did that change happen? Very recently, a year or two ago. It's, it's pretty recent. Yeah, kind of, because I remember 50%. Yeah, it went from 50 to 75 and then to 100. But the control, they didn't get more control over the system. And then there's the hybrid. I know I'm, how much time do I have just to do a check in here? Uh, we have about another um, five to 10 minutes. Okay. So I'll just kind of breeze through and please stop me if you have some questions or comments. Um, but there's, there's something in between those goalposts. That was really my point is that there's two archetypal programs and something in between. Uh, this next diagram on cost internalization here is you know, very simplistic, but just shows you that uh, you know, the producer pays into the system, into the stewardship organization, or you know, there's that diagonal line down. The producer can do it themselves. You usually find it more cost effective to join a stewardship organization. Um, and then in this case, it's more like the British Columbia model where it's industry run. You know, they figure out the costs and they hire you know, someone to collect, someone to process, you know, someone to educate, and, and, and they have their vendors. Um, if this was the Quebec system, the industry-run program, that would say government-run programs, municipal-run programs. Um, and there would be a reimbursement to the municipalities for their costs. So again, you know, idealized program. The arrow is going down to the retailer and the consumer. It may or may not happen. This is the cost thing. You know, for an eco fee, it has to be handed down from the producer. It's legislatively the assessment has to be handed down. Producer, you know, doesn't doesn't have to. It's just incorporated into the product. Is there any impact on effectiveness? Whether or not, I mean, part of sometimes we've had discussions about when you see a fee, it's. Like, gives the customer a little mental check-in on, um, oh, there's a fee related to this, so they may make different, it may modify behavior in a different way. Is, is there the one uh, the type of program tend to be more effective than the other? I think I could run, I think we could have a week-long conference on this and still uh, have, <laughs> have no conclusion, but with lots of interesting discussion. I don't think we've come to that yet. Yeah. I think governments prefer cost internalization because they want industry to do it and to set up the broad umbrella of it. Um, I know industry would rather have some fee that it's cons cause that's consumer funded, it's not industry funded. So, you know, that, and that's part of the negotiations that take place on any different product. So, to step back, um, we can, again, we work on over 20 different products, uh, and there, there's a recipe for this. So it's not that for every product, like packaging, we have to reinvent the wheel. We have, you know, you, we're going to use the same, uh, same elements and same process that we have for paint, thermostats, lamps, 
electronics, you know, all a lot of the other systems, it's just modified. So we have to say that. So the key elements of EPR programs, you have the legislation, which levels the playing field, producers being responsible for financing and often managing programs. You have that stewardship organization that is, you know, that brings efficiency and frankly governments would rather have, you know, one stewardship organization rather than 300 plans from all the different producers. It's better for everybody. Uh, the performance goals, you need to figure out whether the program's working and how to define that with convenience standards and or performance goals. And then government oversight. So those are some of the main ones, but there's 20 of them that we, you, we have for every single element. Um, and we've developed a, a model for the, on all these different elements for packaging. So that's what we, we've developed it. We're going through it with each of the states and it, you know, it goes through. Well, what are the scope of products do you want? You know, do you want you know, just those that sold into the residential area? Do you want commercial? Do you want institutional? Uh, you know, and there's variations. So we've gone through and we've come up with what our brain trust of government officials all over the country have said is kind of the sweet spot. And then there's other things to consider. And so we're going through that with various states right now. And you know, there, so there's a recipe here, and we've used this for developing other models. Um, the next slide is just showing that these um, systems are complementary. Um, one does not have to take over another. EPR is the centerpiece. It's by no means the only thing. If there's other things around it, like the bottle bill, pay-as-you-throw programs, recycled content standards, you know, bag bans, fees, even voluntary programs. They all have a role in a way to manage packaging um, here in, in Vermont and the United States. One thing on the bottle bills, it, it is, uh, you know, it's the third rail, if you will, in many discussions, and I think it's important to have it uh, in this discussion. That one, you know, many many states are saying, well, we have our bottle bill, we like our bottle bill. Um, so we're going to look at the EPR system and define what they call covered materials, you know, what's covered under the EPR program. We're not going to have the bottle bill materials included in that, meaning the bottle bill can be separate, complementary to the EPR program. Now, the complication, I don't want to go into it too much, is like, well, if you have that, then there's going to be some of the bottle bill materials get into the EPR system. And so there needs to be a flow of funds back and forth, and there's calculations, and British Columbia does it one way. <laughs> Kim knows all this stuff well. Uh, British Columbia does it one way, Quebec does it another way. This is all negotiated out. Um, there's a way to you know, make it, quote, fair uh, there, but the systems coexist, and they coexist all over the world. Uh, and just in context, in Quebec, the total proportion of bottle bill material that comes at the recycling sorting centers is very small. It's 1.4%. So it's important, yes, but let's put it into context. Another thing to point out is that there's various roles. We call this producer responsibility. I think, you know, in one way, it, we called it that because producers had not taken or had been given or required to take responsibility. So it's been the focus on them. I didn't call our organization the Producer Responsibility Institute. It's the Product Stewardship Institute. It's broader because there are there's roles everyone has. Uh, you know, state government has oversight. And you have recycling policies, sometimes funding. You um, have local governments with mandates, education. You have the consumer that can do pay as you throw or, or has to really bring their products. Um, so everyone has that responsibility. These systems, these roles um, are articulated well or should be in an EPR system. So I'm near the end here. And so governments are considering various things. I mean, some are just looking at the status quo, and I think we always have to think about that. Voluntary you know, could lead to dropping programs, dropping materials from the program, or more government investment. More government says, oh, I gotta pay more. No one likes it, but you know, they don't want to disappoint their residents, so they're gonna you know, find the emergency funding and stick it in to keep the recycling program. Some are doing that. 
Um, but California, as Kathy covered, you know, all packaging recyclable or compostable by 2030, that was in the bill, come back again, 75% uh, reduction of single-use packaging by 2030. Uh, Washington went the route um, this past year of a study bill, which they're now starting to implement, which Kathy mentioned. She mentioned the resolve here in, uh, in, in Maine in 2019, and they're looking to pass a bill in 2020, so they're going through that. So those are some things. We are working with a lot of other states, and for years, we've brought all these states together um, to, again, that brain trust of state and local government. These are all our members, many board members. Um, you know, she should mention that you know, Kathy and Jen are board members of our organization. Um, doesn't mean that we agree on everything. Um, we, we, uh, we work on things together. Um, but we have, we have members and board members from all these different states. We bring them together um, so that we could share information and, and try to get to some models that the industry uh, might want to consider um, as well. So you can't come to the industry with some ideas if, if there's 12 different voices or 50 different voices talking. That's why we started our organization, to have the coordinated voice and the discussion. It helps the industry as well as it does the government agency. So there's activity in all these different states, particularly in, um, in the top four or five. Oregon, New York are very active. Indiana, Massachusetts, you know, less so as well. But there's other states considering this, of course. We're working on federal legislation. Uh, Senator Udall and Representative Lowenthal staff have asked us to help them in crafting a federal bill, which we've been doing. Um, and so that's a comprehensive proposal that has EPR as the centerpiece. Um, uh, we didn't put all these elements in. They came with some ideas, a national bottle bill, um, bag ban and fee, single-use plastics. We're doing this as much to protect our members in the states, because some of them say, hey, we don't want to lose that bottle bill money, um, as it is to try to get something that's reasonable that would be reflected at the state level, too. So there's consistency in a federal approach and a state approach as well. Um, last, I, I did, I don't know if it, it got out, but I have a chapter in this book. I make no money off this at all, but um, it, it might be useful. This is Tom Zaki's book. He's from Paracycle. There's a, a section here. It's like six pages on the future of packaging. It's EPR um, and packaging, and there's a link there if you want to get it. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, anyone, um, can you have any questions for me to yourself? Scott, I had a question on your last slide. You went to earlier about yeah. the cost internalization, but the ego fee. How many of those does the industry manage the program versus reimbursement in terms of that British Columbia Quebec type model? Um, so where there's EPR programs, so uh, let's see. That would be all, those would be industry programs here. Yeah, pesticides is, is one that actually should, uh, pesticide containers is the industry. That, those are industry, those are all industry run programs on the left hand side here. Okay, and the right hand side, right? The right hand side is also industry run programs, yes. yes. Pesticide fees, as you know here, is government run but has a fee on the pesticides. So industry funded partially. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much once again. It's very helpful. Thank you very much for having me here. I think we might have more here. questions. Yeah, if you have any questions, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to <laughs> So back, back to work again. Yeah. Here we go. So um, can you keep educating us on um, but EPR. Certainly try the great thing about going third is a lot of it's been set. So the kind of where we have to not only what Kathy and Scott have uh, talked about, but also John Eddy from the um, first meeting said. Um, just to just to reiterate, the municipalities are required um, by state statute to ensure that solid waste is done properly in their jurisdiction and many of them have joined together as solid waste management entities or swimmers. And there's a few yellow spots on the map that are independent towns that are um, going on at it on their own and they satisfy the solid waste implementation plan requirements. Um, 
And part of that, those requirements are to ensure that there are collection systems available for waste that is um, banned from landfill disposal. And mandatory recyclables are a subset of the single-use products that has been defined for this working group. So, um, so I'll be talking about how, uh, how EPR might impact these municipalities. So just to review the collection system that we have in place, it's for single-use uh, products or mandatory recyclables are done two primary ways. One is by curbside collection, and the other is a drop-off collection. Curbside collection is, generally speaking, a contract between the individual, the, um, the business, or the resident uh, with the hauler. And uh, drop-off collection is where municipalities uh, will provide a drop-off spot for mandatory recyclables, but it's also done by the private sector. So remember that Act 148 requires any transfer stations that collect trash to also collect mandatory recyclables. So those transfer stations, whether it's private sector or municipal, municipally run, um, must collect those recyclables. And up till recently, um, was not able to charge for the recyclables that were collected. Um, and that has changed. Uh, so there are a few municipalities that do provide uh, collection for the entire town that they oversee uh, through their tax base. Uh, and those are listed here. But that's an anomaly. Um, and Vermont is different in that a lot of states in the United States are, are like these municipalities. They they collect the um, money in taxes and they ensure that trash and recycling is picked up at the curb. So Vermont's are kind of different in this respect. Uh, once those recyclables are collected, they generally go to two large, two of the largest uh, MRFs, uh, the single stream MRFs in the state, the only single stream MRFs in the state. One's owned by CSWD, one's owned by Casella. Um, but some of those source separated drop off sites, whether they're privately operated or publicly operated, market their own materials. So the Northeast Kingdom, for example, markets their materials that they collect because they're source separated by the users coming in. They're separating all the recyclables out, and it's a commodity for the Northeast Kingdom to market from that point. But generally speaking, it's uh, a good portion of the materials goes to the two single stream marks. Uh, the tip fees at those MRFs are currently $65 a ton at CSWD and over $100 a ton, I believe, in, in Rutland and Casella's MRF. So if you're looking at EPR options for single-use product, products um, and how that might impact these collection systems, and Scott had some, some slides for the different systems in Canada, and this is um, pretty much the British, British Columbia uh, system, uh, what it might look like in Vermont. So one option would be that we would contract at our, um, uh, with a stewardship organization to compensate for the collection and the processing of the recyclables. Um, or we might give up that uh, control and allow the producer responsibility organization to act on our behalf and uh, collect those materials under a separate contract, maybe with a, a separate entity. Or we would just continue to collect the material on our own um, outside of the stewardship program. But that's really dependent on how the legislation is written and whether you know there is that options available. I would say given our system and, and how they're uh, different entities that are managing these systems, both the private and the public sector, uh, sector you would want that flexibility. Are all three of those currently in play in Vermont for the consistent EPR programs we already have? Uh, yes, I would say when I'm trying to think. Um, so paint, for example, uh, the solid waste planning entities have the option of, they don't have to collect the paint, but they can collect the paint. 
Um, and if they do, they can get reimbursed from the producer responsibility organization, Pain Care. Mm -hmm. um, um, there, I can't, and there are retailers that collect also on behalf of the producer responsibility. So, you know, it, it's. I think it, it, it would reflect this this model. Yeah. Um, more on that. Mm -hmm. How specifically on the paint? I I, I understand that. The paint in our area gets turned into new paint, if you will. Right. Um, and how does that, is that cost netted out when they're reimbursed by the manufacturer? Yeah, so that's a great question um, and one that I really want to touch on when we talk about costs. So um, this is a little bit of a contentious issue with the paint program and um, the entities that collect the paint, the solid waste management <clears throat> districts, and um, not so much the retailers because they're, you know, they, they want to do it, they want to collect it to drive traffic through the stores, but um, paint care and the law doesn't require paint care to pay for collection costs. So in the, in the paint um, model, what happens in general is the solid waste planning entity will do a collection event or collect paint at their programs and they will get the um, disposal or the recycling and transportation disposal of the paint taken care of by paint care. Um, in the situation where CSWD takes the paint and we remanufacture it, paint care pays us to do that. They, we, they actually pay us to process that paint. So we are getting our full costs covered or m most of our costs covered to do that for them. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a third, um, there's a, another way that recyclables are collected in, um, by municipalities and that's the public space recycling that we're required to provide if, um, if municipalities provide a trash container in a public space like a downtown or a park they're also required to provide a recycling container next to that recycling, uh, next to the trash container. So in the EPR system, I would expect, because this is mandated by law, that wherever there's trash um, collection, there's recycling collection, I would expect that the, that the law would require the, the stewardship organization to also pay for these other collection systems. Meaning that there would be a third collection, or meaning that they would they support meaning that they would they would support the mm -hmm. yeah they would support paying for the collection system in public spaces, but it wouldn't be an additional system, an right. additional receptacle. Correct. It's okay. just the recycling <coughs> container next to the trash container. The recycling. I would anticipate would be part of the EPR program, right? Because it's another way that municipalities are collecting recyclables. And it's a, a fairly significant cost for municipalities that provide that, that you know, container in their public spaces to manage it. Um, so another area that solid waste uh, planning entities and municipalities have to um, meet the requirements of the solid waste implementation plan is through education about recycling. And so we're, we're required to educate schools, businesses, residents, year-round uh, multimedia campaigns, and um, that is at a, um, a significant cost. With an EPR system, EPR uh, programs typically have education requirements built into those um, laws and the the result is a more uniform education that would be provided statewide that would potentially be easier for the consumer to understand with less confusion and possibly more uh, participation in programs and less recycling contamination. Um, so just as an aside, CSWD uh, budgeted just under a million dollars this past fiscal year 
for our outreach and communications department. So it's a pretty significant. We don't just print ads and produce brochures. We're in the schools, we're in businesses, we're real hands on helping our community recycle. So these are the potential impacts that I came up with for municipalities. Um, if there were an EPR system uh, implemented in Vermont for packaging, um, there's a lot of potential outcomes and it really depends on how the legislation is written. Um, but definitely municipalities would see a de decrease or possibly an elimination of cost for collection. So as I said, um, we're required to have collection for recycling at drop-off sites where we collect trash, and um, that that is something that a lot of municipalities cover through the trash fees. So um, this would offset the, the, those costs for municipalities. Um, if there was a high convenience standard and recovery rate requirements, there would potentially be additional curbside collection, additional drop-off, infrastructure, there'd be, as I said, statewide education. Um, curbside collection would likely be consolidated and more efficient than subscription service. Um, the downside of that is the individual wouldn't be able to choose their caller necessarily. So um, that, that would be something to consider. And there would potentially be more collection opportunities for materials that aren't collected in the traditional recycling system, like coffee pods or film, that would be another material that the producers would potentially be trying to capture elsewhere. Um, there is the risk of the, uh, the uh, stranded public investment within the EPR system, particularly where the marks are, are involved, so we would want some kind of insurance um, through the legislation that that would be uh, utilized. In the system and not become stranded. Could you, could, could you um, elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, so um, in some of our EPR laws, we require utilization of the, the existing infrastructure. For, for the, if that existing infrastructure wants to participate, so to speak. So, um, for example, with the paint EPR program, uh, there was a, the requirement was in, in the law that said if a municipality wants to collect paint, you must allow them into the producer program, right? So if we're running household hazardous waste events and we capture paint, then we're allowed to participate in, in the EPR program. The producers have to pay for that paint. So with the, with the MRF, I can see it as being a requirement to utilize the existing infrastructure, the, the MRFs, um, if the MRFs can and want to accept that material. And it would be, you know, uh, obviously, a, a, a business deal with the MRF and, and a negotiation um, on the costs and what would be paid. Yeah, for the stranded infrastructure, Utilization question: Do you see performance requirements? Obviously, you know, if the infrastructure is created, we want it to be efficient to meet performance requirements, accept more materials, those types of things. Do you see that as part? Of as long as it was is is funded, yeah. 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 I mean, if you have to put in a whole new piece of equipment to capture laminated pouches or something yeah, yeah. like that. That's, you know, that wouldn't be something that the MERS would stand up and, and be able to do on their own yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to see if, if that's been done, because obviously paints, you, you take it and process it, but with packaging, we've got a bunch of different materials and there would need to be performance benchmarks if we're going to be mandated to use certain infrastructure, right? Right. So I want to talk briefly about the goals of an EPR system for single-use packaging. And again, Scott did go through some of these. Mine, um, some of mine are redundant, some we had that I didn't have. But these are kind of, the first two are kind of the pillars behind EPR programs, right? 
They generally give financial relief for municipalities, and they aim to recover more material. Those are, the, those are generally the primary goals, and, and I think that would, could be accomplished through EPR for packaging. Um, the, the, another um, goal of EPR is to encourage producers to minimize <coughs> packaging and design it for recovery and, and recyclability. And we talked about the modulating fees. Um, and uh, there's a, a fourth goal that's <coughs> just being talked about, just the, the conversations are just starting um, between uh, public officials and producers about uh, overall environmental impacts and looking at packaging in that light. Um, and, and looking at the entire life cycle of the production and use of packaging and not just the end of life management. Um, so when you're looking for, looking at the circular economy or design for end of life, that's really a subset of the whole impact of a package, of packaging and, and products, right? So, there's mining of the material to make the packaging, there's manufacturing, there's the use of it or getting it to the producer to use the package, and then it gets to um, the consumer somehow. And there's, there's greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts all along the way through that whole um, life cycle analysis. And when you get to the consumer at the end of the when you get it to the consumer, the consumer's interaction with the packaging is really just, what do I do with this? And on one hand, the consumer thinks, if I can't recycle it, then this is a bad package. If I can recycle it, it's good, or right? it's good for the environment. And that's not necessarily true, because some packaging um, that you can recycle might have a greater environmental impact than the packaging that you can't recycle if you look at the whole life cycle analysis. And that's something that I think this group should just be considering when we're thinking about policy for packaging because what we don't want to do is just encourage um, packaging to be used that's just recyclable because that's not necessarily the best thing for the environment. And I'll give you an example. Um, here you have three different ways you can purchase coffee, right? One's in a steel can, one's in a plastic container, one's in a plastic uh, flexible pouch. Um, and when you look at the life cycle of those three types of packaging, the energy consumption and the CO2 emissions for the steel can and the plastic container um, are higher than the flexible pouch, which is more favorable. However, the flexible pouch is not recyclable. So in the end, if you're really looking at the environment, you know, the best choice from an environmental perspective, um, it's probably the flexible pouch versus the other two containers even though it's not recyclable. Um, and in an ideal world, you'd get the flexible pouch and that'd be recyclable too. I mean, I think that's what we're all aiming for. And I know Representative McCullough, you have Vermont Coffee uh, Company, and that's probably better than all three because it's a paper bag with just the plastic bag inside of it. But this is just to demonstrate um, that, that example. I think it does it well. And when you start to think about all the packaging that's being introduced now versus what was out there 10 years. There's laminates and pouches and all kinds of materials that aren't recyclable. But if you think about um, the, you know, whether, how it's protecting the, 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 the product or the whole life cycle of that package versus just what do you do it, with it in the end, um, you might find that a lot of those are preferable for the, from an environmental standpoint. And I, you know, I think, again, it's really important to look at. Here's another scenario that's just a little bit different than looking at the life cycle of the package itself, but it's more about um, protecting the product. So um, this is one that irks so many people, including myself. It's like, 
why do I have to have a plastic piece of plastic on my cucumber when I buy it? And the reason why is that it, um, it really extends the shelf life of that cucumber um, pretty significantly. And when you look at the greenhouse gas emissions of, uh, of, of this product, most of the environmental impact has occurred in agriculture, in, in growing it and getting it to the grocery store. Um, the thin piece of plastic has a very low environmental impact. And you don't want to waste you know, what's been put into this um, product in terms of energy. So you know, that, that's why you have the piece of plastic on it. By the way, um, there's a uh, edible coating that's being developed that would potentially someday replace this plastic wrap on the cucumber. And you're not supposed to eat that. <laughs> <laughs> so again, when thinking about policy, these are the different packaging attributes to encourage in an EPR system. Um, recycled content is generally a very positive attribute to to uh, require um, reusable, obviously. Recyclable and recoverable is, is oftentimes um, preferable, but sometimes when you're looking at the overall greenhouse gas emissions and recycle, um, it's not the better choice. Um, and bio-based and compostable, that has a whole other um, issues involved with that as well, from lack of collection infrastructure and um, other, other issues that we could delve into as well. So in, in, um, in summary, I think um, EPR for single-use products legislation, in order for it to be successful, legislation should have a high level of convenience and access for recycling. It should include um, a good deal of statewide education. All collection costs should be covered. We don't want to get stuck in where we are with the paint program. I think it's a great program, but there's a lot of um, collection programs that uh, have a difficult time covering all the costs of collection of paint. Um, I think there should be municipal choice and participation as well as uh, the private sector should also be able to choose whether or not they want to participate in, that, in the program. Um, there should be a requirement that existing infrastructure is utilized. Um, and again, we should really look at those modulating fees and overall environmental impact to encourage design for the environment and not just design for recyclability, because that's really missing the mark. Any questions for Jen? Jen, municipal choice. Um, you, you, you are promoting municipal choice. Could you talk about that some more? Is that like this, this municipality um, shouldn't be required to have or, or are you talking about the the, uh, the multi-layered system, whether or not uh, such as the Quebec model? So what I'm talking about is that um, if you look at, say, the drop-off site collection programs, and some of them are municipally run, some are for private sector runs those programs. Um, some of them are getting materials coming in from consumers that are source separated. Mm -hmm. And so they, they end up with a bit of aluminum and they might want to market that mm -hmm. on their own. They, they might market all of their materials on their own. And that's worked for them. They're covering their costs. Maybe they're covering their costs and then some. I think in today's market, it's probably a stretch to say they're covering their costs. But um, I think that if they want to continue to do that, then they should be able to do that and not participate, not 
um, participate in the stewardship program. So the stewards would not pay them, contract them, reimburse them for their collection, they just keep going on their own. And the same for the private sector. There's a lot of transfer stations um, run by the private sector that might want to continue to do that. Okay. But that's not to say that the product won't be managed. Right. It's right. How it's, how it's Yeah, um, again, I, to just to remind you under statute, we have to manage this material, right? So there has to be, um, if we want to collect trash, um, we have to collect the recyclables, and it can't go to the landfill. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the working group, not the committee, I guess. Right? Um, for the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPIRG. Um, and I, uh, my organization has a long history of working on solid waste matters. We were founded in 1972 um, and have spent a great deal of that time working to find ways to reduce waste, um, to encourage reuse and uh, recycling as well. And we've supported many of the programs that have already been talked about here, some of the legislation that has been addressed, including the law that actually gave rise to this working group. So it's a, a pleasure to be here um, before you today. Uh, on, on this topic. Um, now let me see, how do I get from Jen Holliday to Paul Burns? I appreciate the technology assist. That's not a problem. And then you just use that. Great. Thank you. Um, as Jen noted, coming at this stage, you've You've heard a lot of details. I wanted to note that as a follow-up to uh, the passage of the legislation, which, as you know, was the strongest legislation in the country dealing with single-use plastics um, passed earlier this year, um, VPIRG and our outreach staff went door-to-door -door throughout the state talking about the continued issues uh, related to single-use plastic and single-use products more, more broadly. Our canvassers went door to door and they went to every single community in Vermont. We are certainly the only organization that has the capacity to reach out, have direct face-to-face uh, -face conversations with people at their homes in every community in the state. And this summer the topic was on um, single-use plastics and single-use products. I'm not going to talk too much about some of the details there. You're familiar, familiar I think, with the Pacific uh, Garbage Patch. Uh, equal to 64 Vermonts in size um, uh, and more. That's kind of hard for people to get their heads around. And it is massive and it is a problem that is growing. This, this uh, graphic here is one that, again, many of you have heard about. If you saw the National Geographic uh, magazine issue devoted to plastics from June of 2018, you may have seen a similar graphic there. This is where we got the, the data from the same raw material um, and research. But half, what this graphic shows, that half of all plastic ever produced was made in the last 15 years. What that means is that as bad as the problem is today of single-use plastic pollution out there, it is getting way worse every single year, almost every single day. There's that much more plastic being created. And so there's no... Um, uh, kind of end in sight where we would see that leveling off anytime soon. There's more and more products being made of plastic, more and more packaging being made um, as well with plastic. And about half of that total plastic um, is, uh, is, is packaging material. So again, we're seeing this as an increasing problem. Uh, not too much of the plastic has been, is being recycled now over since it was plastic was created, only about 9% of the plastic has been recycled. Certain programs do better, um, for sure. So when we talk about um, our campaign uh, to address this problem, we invited people across the state to sign on to a petition. What would you like to see done about this? These were the conversations we were having. And um, 
This is the petition that we invited people to support. Um, and I want to just note that we were pretty successful with that petition. Uh, I will leave you one copy of this. Sorry, Mike, I'm not going to ask you to make a copy of all this. This is more than 20,000 signatures from Vermonters, from communities across the state who supported the language of this petition that you see up on the screen. It's not terribly specific. This is more an indication that I think, broadly speaking, Vermonters recognize this as an ongoing problem and they want to continue, want to see your continued focus on it. So again, mostly to say thanks. Thanks for being here. I'm, I'm pleased that this working group itself was part of the legislation. Um, and you'll see a lot of support in the communities around the state for what you're doing. You've already made some progress here, so uh, congratulations. You can check off uh, pretty much the first item there because when we started going door to door, that had not yet been passed or signed into law. So well done. Um, there is more to do, and I would say that from VPIRG's perspective, um, this, what the focus of the working group is on, you know, there are a number of different aspects of this. And um, we see, for instance, the need to uh, ban other items, just as the law that you passed uh, banned certain items. I think we can be phasing out other things, uh, whether it's plastic balloons or the release of plastic balloons with helium. Litters, maybe it's just a personal thing for me, but I think little bits of plastic that we use for no particular purpose. Some, there are a couple of Vermonters who don't appreciate the work I do, I guess, and send me envelopes filled with glitter. <laughs> uh, or maybe it's just their way of suggesting we should get rid of this stuff. I guess maybe that would be a more positive way of thinking about it. Um, but there are problems with a lot of things. Your uh, committees both talked a little bit about plastic utensils and things of that sort as well. So. Um, there are all sorts of ways that we can be involved in um, going further here. Um, today's focus of your working group is on EPR, so that's where I want to uh, focus in as well. Um, I'm not going to go into the uh, definition again. Um, I'll just note that um, there is this uh, excellent report. Scott Cassell mentioned um, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and they, uh, I've given you a link, or given Mike a link to this, so if you're interested, this is just an eight-page report that kind of summarizes some of the information that Scott Cassell already noted, but um, that where about uh, small consumer electronics equipment accounts for about one-third of all of the EPR programs worldwide, and now I think the stat is it's about 400 of what they consider to be genuine EPR programs worldwide, a third of those are small electronics. Um, but the packaging does come in at about second place or tied with tires if you consider tires as part of an EPR program. So that's about 17 or 18 percent of all of the EPR programs deal with packaging. So there are examples uh, out there. And, and um, so this is an excellent little report and, and you've got uh, at least the, uh, the connection to that. So I wanted to, to kind of focus in on one aspect of this because these EPR programs are being considered and, and passed and adopted in an environment where citizens are putting more and more pressure, honestly, on uh, companies that are creating this material, this packaging material to a large extent. People are seeing it. It's something that we find it is, this is not a partisan issue. You know, across the political spectrum, people are seeing that after each trip to the store, they come home with a lot of stuff that is of no value to them, and they've got to find a way to get rid of it. Um, and so it had a useful life of minutes, and now it's going to be around for 500 years or more. But consider Coca-Cola. Um, Coca-Cola, of course, uh, they own Dasani, they own all sorts of beverages. It's not just literally Coca-Cola in their bottles, but they put out, um, and I don't have the statistic here in front of me, but it's many, many millions or billions of containers filled with Coke or water. Um, sometimes people say that you know they're, they're, they're a plastic packaging company that puts water in things, they're not a water, you know, they don't make the water. Um, so uh, they, there's a lot of pressure being put on them. Coca-Cola in that environment has started to say, well, we're going to do something about this voluntarily. In Australia, they have said, they've committed to put, uh, making the um, 70, they say that 70% of their bottles will be made from 100% recycled PET by 2019. And that's what this article talks about uh, from earlier this year. This is their press release, the top item there talks about that pretty bold um, uh, pledge and commitment regarding what Coke's going to do in Australia. 
In the US um, and in Europe, Coca-Cola has uh, committed to 50% recycled content by 2030. Again, this article was from uh, 2018. I don't know that that's changed. I think, as far as I know, that's still an accurate figure. So that they are not gonna go as far, but Coke is still committed to making some progress here. Uh, so that's a good thing. The problem is that Coke can't possibly meet these pledges or commitments um, because we don't have enough recycled content right now. Recycled PET plastic. So Plastics News, for instance, had this article from earlier this year, 2019, the big plans for recycled content, um, meaning that we need more PET, uh, and therefore they argue that we need more bottle bills, or that's what the result will be. So if we want to achieve the kind of environmental gains major brands have been talking about for plastic bottles like Coca-Cola, um, in the US, it will need a Herculean effort and more than double its recycling rate for PET bottles. The other highlighted uh, piece there is that demand for so many more recycled bottles to feed Coke and others will threaten to overwhelm our recycling systems and lead to much more pressure for national deposit laws. Um, this is from Plastics News. This is not you know, some left-wing um, uh, Enviro publication, although I think they know they're speaking the truth here. NAPCOR, which is the National Association of Plastics Recyclers, has also said that um, that we will need more recycled PET to meet the demands that are out there. So that's, um, that's kind of the state of the, the situation today is that there isn't enough of the recycled material. They need more recycled content in order to meet these demands. And as consumers press for higher and higher amounts of recycled content in the containers, as legislators consider requirements for more recycled content, they're gonna to need to get it from someplace. And that's where we would argue the bottle bill uh, comes in. And uh, Coca-Cola, uh, at least in Europe and elsewhere, seems to agree. Um, Coca-Cola here says that the bottle return scheme, they don't mean scheme in a negative sense, if you're familiar with the way British use the term scheme, I think they really mean system. Uh, but. There you go, uh, their system is a once in a generation opportunity. That's what uh, the Coca-Cola representatives say in Europe. Um, I will say that that is not, has not been Coke's position here in the United States of America, or in North America at least. They are, have a separate decision making body and they have not been as receptive to an expanded bottle bill in this country. So that's worth noting. We believe though that the bottle bill program is one that is appropriate for your consideration today as a kind of EPR. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we should be thinking about modernizing the bottle bill that is, was also created in 1972. Number one, it's a great follow-up to, um, to the plastics legislation that we passed earlier this year. All of those water, water bottles and other plastic containers um, that, uh, that contain <coughs> beverages uh, many of those are getting out into our environment today, and Vermont could consider a ban on plastic water bottles. Um, that could be another area of consideration for this working group, but my expectation is that you will not, within the next year, ban all plastic water bottles in the state. There are some communities, municipalities around the country that have decided to ban certain of those water bottles. Um, you might say that we don't really need it for the eight ounce water bottles. Uh, that's, a, that's a policy question, um, but as long as we are generating plastic um, water bottles and, and selling these plastic water bottles, Beeper's position is that we should do all we can to prevent them from getting out into the environment. Uh, that is, we should recycle, collect them and recycle as many of those as we can, and if you recycle them in a clean way, and it is much, there's much less contamination through the bottle, bottle redemption program, then that plastic that you gather from a bottle bill program can be turned into new plastic bottles. So that Coke has some hope of achieving and meeting its pledge that it put out there for recycled content in the US and more broadly. So that's, that's kind of the goal for the plastics piece. Uh, the second reason is it's, uh, it's a way of dealing with some of the harder to recycle items like glass. We've seen glass in the news lately. Glass doesn't always find its way to um, uh, to uh, highest level recycling and uh, being turned into other glass products. 
Um, and so it's appropriate to think of ways to increase the odds that glass can be recycled, either into new glass bottles or into fiberglass or things like that. That's higher level recycling. We would prefer that than even downcycling, which is using it in road construction material or the like. Um, but certainly, glass that comes to the bottle program is also less contaminated, it has a higher value, and is more likely to be return, uh, turned into a glass bottle again. So another reason to support it. And then finally, just after 47 years, there are other reasons why we should consider updating or modernizing the bottle bill. One example of that is that the deposit is still a nickel. Um, it was a nickel in 1972, it's a nickel um, today. If it had kept uh, pace with inflation, it would be worth, uh, Mr. Chairman, you may know, but I think it's more than 30 cents today. 32. 32 cents uh, today, That if it kept uh, pace with inflation. So, um, so there are a lot of reasons why you should consider it. Is the bottle bill EPR? Um, I don't want to get too hung up on um, definitions here, but it's a, it's a consumer product system that has spurred green design. It has established a take-back model. It has increased recycling. It's paid for by the producers of the packaging material. So at VPER, we absolutely think that the bottle bill is um, a, an example of extended producer responsibility. Um, Thomas Lindquist, who is a Swedish professor of environmental economics, coined the term extended producer responsibility more than two decades ago. He classifies the deposit return system as EPR, devoted an entire chapter in his doctoral thesis to it, as a matter of fact. The OECD considers it EPR, the National Recycling Coalition, the National Container uh, <coughs> Recycling Institute all consider uh, the bottle bill programs to be EPR. So uh, I think it fits in today's conversation. Um, we, if you were to add, for instance, modernize the bottle bill in Vermont by extending it to cover water bottles, wine bottles, and sports drinks, you would dramatically increase the number of containers that could be recycled under that system in this state. So for instance, just with the wine, uh, water bottles alone, that's about 175 million containers, 175 million additional containers each year in Vermont. 175 million. Um, mm -hmm. Under the current bottle program, there are about 326 million containers covered by the program as it exists today. If you added sports drinks, you would get another 8.3 million containers. If you added wine, which is mostly glass bottles, you get almost 18 million more. So that's more than 200 million additional containers that would come under the system if you modernize the bottle bill by expanding its scope. If you increase the deposit, we would think that you would do that for all containers uh, to at least a dime. Um, but you might consider a modulated fee system, or, or you might consider Vermont's current system to be already be modulated because liquor bottles are at 15 cents today. I, I presume that's because they are bigger bottles, uh, but I actually am not certain of the rationale for that. But so it's at least a two tiered system. You might consider that a modulated system. It might make sense to continue that, uh, that path um, if we were to add wine bottles to the system, for instance, so that the wine bottles would be 15 cents. So that's something to uh, consider there. We believe that the bottle bill can also work well, work effectively with curbside recycling programs. Um, that, that is the way it exists in a number of other states and another, a number of other provinces and other areas around the country and around the world. Um, in this small way, I guess I take a little uh, issue with what Kathy Jamison said, where she mentioned that we've got two separate programs or um, a parallel programs, one for bottle bill, one for everything else. But the fact is we've got multiple systems right now for all of the other programs that we have that are EPR programs. Um, each one of those has its own different um, uh, means of collecting back the material, whether it's for light bulbs or thermostats or what have you. So um, I think we've got multiple today, and I think they each work really well, including the bottle bill. Um, the challenges right now are mostly with our recycling program and the curbside single stream recycling, which uh, ends up, when you throw a lot of these materials in together, you necessarily have a higher degree of contamination. Glass and paper in these systems together can be kind of mortal enemies, and um, that means that all of it is worth a little bit less. 
Um, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not presenting the answer to that particular problem to you today, but it is something that should be considered, is whether the existing single stream recycling program is one that can allow us to be as successful as we really want to be at making sure that those items that people dutifully put into their blue bins are actually being recycled and turned into uh, products again. Um, but as for whether recycling, uh, curbside recycling and bottle bill can work uh, well together, I, I will submit uh, for your consideration, we've given you again a, um, a link to this overall report. It's done by um, Unomia looking at the uh, Ontario system. Ontario has, uh, as far as I know, North America's oldest curbside recycling program, and they are now considering uh, expanding their bottle, uh, bottle bill program to include non uh, alcoholic items, and um, uh, and this is a rather in-depth report and analysis that looks at how these two would work together and concludes that the two programs would work very effectively together. Um, and that is an issue that we would have to grapple with here. What would be the impact on uh, the solid waste districts, for instance, if you were to take uh, the PET plastic bottles out of the system um, and recycle them through the bottle bill program, where if you took the glass out and so forth. And there are obviously pros and cons. But I'll just read uh, two sentences from their executive summary. They note that there are 10, more than 10,000 tons of plastic end up in the Great Lakes every year, breaking down into microscopic pieces. You're familiar with the health risks and other uh, problems there. It's estimated that beverage containers account for approximately 40% of litter by volume. And according to a 2016 Toronto litter audit, PET beverage bottles alone accounted for 15.4% by weight of all the large recyclable litter surveyed by the city. It's just an indication that plastic bottles are a, not an insignificant problem um, when we're talking about, certainly talking about uh, waste and litter and the problem of single-use products. So I encourage you to consider carefully this question of whether we can expand upon, build upon the successful program that we've already had in place for 47 years um, so that it is even more successful at collecting more items, um, perhaps 40% more containers, and turning them into new recycled products. And indeed, if we have any hope of achieving a circular economy, which we've also talked some about, you need to find ways of getting material back into that circular system and the bottle bill, because it has cleaner material, can be used, and this is the plastics industry folks saying, it can be used much more readily uh, than other kinds of plastic through curbside programs to make a new PET bottle, for instance. So that's why we um, encourage you to consider uh, updating and modernizing the bottle bill. It's one of the items, one of the to-do items for this working group. We are supportive of some of the other testimony that you've heard, looking at other kinds of plastic packaging. Um, perhaps modulated fees. I would note that Ontario, and you will see this in this uh, report, they, that is one of those places where they charge uh, manufacturers of the material to pay for the curbside recycling programs. I think it's 50% on its way to 100% if I am remembering correctly. So with more of that information in the, in the report. Because the liquor is distributed through state stores, is there data that shows the percentage of bottles that are returned <coughs> liquor yeah. specifically because that's at the 15 cent level? Our um, estimates working with Container Recycling Institute, who are really kind of the national experts on this, uh, is that about 84% of the liquor bottles are recycled, uh, are brought back for redemption, I should say. And if they're brought back for redemption, uh, nearly universally you're seeing those containers being recycled into something else. The um, uh, for the non-liquor bottles, the beer and soda, um, I go by the figure that was contained in the 2013 DEC report, which is about a 75% re uh, redemption rate. DEC, that's national or state? In Vermont. In, yeah, and that same report had a 74 to 75% return rate for liquor as well. I can help you with the data on that. Are the data that we have for liquor is more recent than that, for going off the sales data of the CRI, so we'd be happy to talk about it, but it's somewhere. It's national versus Vermont. No, this was Vermont. Okay. But I would, let's, we'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah. Are questions for oh. um, Paul, I've heard that the redemption centers 
are pretty challenged with the current system that we have with sortation of all the different plants um, that are in the common mode system. Like there's over a hundred sorts for those redemption centers. Uh, how would you see, um, you know, do you, do you get a sense of where the redemption centers are at with an expansion proposal and how do you see that being able to be supported by the infrastructure that we have? Um, one, I, it's, I cannot speak, wouldn't suggest that I'm speaking on behalf of all the redemption centers out there. In fact, there is, um, there, are, there are a number of them and then, then they might have their own opinions about this. So it's worth looking at. And there is no one association that does a terrific job of, of trying to figure out you know, what the position of the redemption center is. So all of that by context. We've certainly been working with several redemption center owners as we talk about some of these next steps. They are supportive. They think that we could move forward with this kind of a, of a modernization or expansion of the scope of the program effectively. We know that a number of states have gone beyond what Vermont currently has in their systems. Um, and they seem to be working reasonably well. Just around us, for instance, New York and Connecticut added water bottles. It was probably almost 10 years ago now <laughs> when they decided to uh, have the state begin collecting the unclaimed deposits. Um, and Maine has you know, more materials than that. Um, so I think we have examples of where it has been done. I think we could uh, provide you with testimony from Redemption Center owners here if the committee would be interested in hearing from them. Um, which again is, is not necessarily saying that's the way all of them feel, but, but, but it would probably be useful to hear from someone about how they, could, how they might grapple with any kind of expansion like that. But the other thing is um, we have a, a bit of an antiquated system with the, um, the way of how they deal with it um, and, and trying to separate each one out. Um, really, from a recycling perspective, you just want to separate them out so that the material or the color of the glass is the same, you know, so that, that it can be more easily recycled, but it's an accounting uh, process really that requires the, the separating things out. And it may be, we believe that technology exists that could allow for more of the commingling. And um, Tamra is the, is the um, reverse vending machine owner, for instance, that uh, my understanding is they may have some technology that could assist so that um, it, what the system we have may, now may be uh, improved upon to, so that there would be less of that separation, less of that kind of separating burden uh, placed on the redemption center owners. We'd be very interested in looking at that too. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Um, well, I have, as, as you're well aware, um, supported significant expansion of the model bill for years. Um, I'm, I am becoming more and more concerned um, Especially, in, I guess, in today's um, in today's uh, atmosphere of, of recycling, about the harm, the economic harm to the solid waste districts if they take up a, a significant amount of the PET out of their system. Um, so, are you aware of? Of, of that being a problem in other in other states or countries, and how that's been spoken to or is being considered to be spoken to. This analysis for Ontario is looking at exactly that question. For instance, what, where, how would the finances be affected um, if you were to take away from the municipal systems um, effectively? the aluminum, those things of value, aluminum and to a lesser extent PET, but also taking more glass, which is a financial and logistical hurdle for those uh, same municipalities and municipal systems. Mm -hmm. So there are some pros and cons there, but then you also look at other, other financial advantages that come from recycling more um, and perhaps reducing curbside pickup programs and so forth. I mean, if you can do enough to get more materials into a bottle bill redemption program, there are other cost advantages. That's what this analysis finds. So I'd be happy to try to pull some of that out for you, but I think uh, if you, we've given um, Mike the link to the full report. Again, it was 150 pages or so. I wasn't gonna uh, have copies for everybody in the interest of trees. But, um, but we could pull out some of those specific citations and analysis that might be helpful to you. I think 
the other thing to consider is that if if you were to expand the program and if you were to raise the deposit to a dime, you would be increasing the amount of unclaimed deposit monies that would be coming to the state. Um, there's a question about what happens to that money then. Right now it is, it goes to, clean, we'll begin going to clean water programs in two weeks, I guess. It's, it takes effect on October 1st. Um, or, and the state will get its first revenue in January of next year. But it might be appropriate to look at uh, using some of that revenue to the extent that there is a financial disadvantage to any of those um, uh, municipal or uh, regional recycling systems there. Let's look at how we can, how we can make that work. Um, I think that's a, that's a conversation that we should be having. But there really is no question, if you're looking at it from a resource perspective, that more material will be collected for recycling. It will be a higher quality material. It will be turned into higher quality recycled items later if you do it through the bottle bill as opposed to the current system of curbside recycling where fewer of the containers ever get put into the blue bins and fewer still are of a quality that can be used for recycling. You know, a bunch of, some of that material ends up going to a landfill. Some of it is just not of a quality that can be used in the same way that a volatile material can. Thank you. Yeah. It's just building on that point, I mean, what we've been hearing from the earlier presenters today, I mean, I would hope we could be looking at, you know, how are we getting the producers to be paying for the system so that we're not hamstrung in, you know, what are the kind of challenging finances that our municipalities and solid waste management entities are in, like let's be shifting that burden so that we can be looking at what's the highest and best way to recycle as much as possible, not recycle less through um, the blue bin system because we have to kind of prop up that, um, that I, I would hope we'd be looking at more of a, a bigger picture approach to the finances. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for the invitation. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Bray and Representative McCullough, members of the working group. Um, my name is Sarah Faye Pierce. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. Um, I don't know if I feel like I'm taking a hard right turn or if I'm just thrusting us out of this whole discussion on EPR, but we're going to talk a little more practically about um, how my industry uses packaging and plastics. And so, um, have some things I want to share with you today and I'm really excited to let you know that this is hot off the presses, brand new information from my industry, Vermont. This working group is the first in the country to get this information. So we're going to look a lot at a lot of pictures today, talk about um, what and how my members are using uh, packaging and um, in the next month or two I hope to if I can't appear again, uh, supplement um, this presentation because we're still doing some ongoing research and having more discussions with our members. So we'll have we'll have more to come as well. Um, so uh, AHAM represents uh, companies uh, that are household names, uh, all the trusted brands like Whirlpool, GE Appliances, and Carrig. I almost said Green Mountain, but Carrig Dr. Pepper, who is is here and makes Vermont their home. Um, these are brands that bring us home comfort, they bring us efficiencies and make our lives in general easier. And, and if anyone has purchased an appliance recently, whether it's a, a portable appliance or a floor care appliance or a major appliance, all of our appliances are capable today of connecting to the internet. And so these, these products are getting a little more complicated. They can make coffee at the perfect temperature for you before you even wake in the morning to letting you know that your milk is running low and asking if you want to have it reordered for you. So we're, we're getting quite sophisticated in the production of these products, um, which really you know, brings us to, to the subject of this working group with plastics and packaging and how that plays a role in making sure that when you as consumers place an order for an appliance, whether it's a major portable or a floor care product, that you're getting what you ordered and that you get what you paid for. And packaging plays a huge role in that. It makes sure it gets to your home safe, securely, and in the condition, proper working order uh, that you expect it to be. So 
when I think of a, a brand new kitchen, I, I come to mind uh, something something along the lines of this. Maybe this isn't the case for everybody, but when you choose to make that decision, it's a big decision to order new appliances for your home, right? And and we do go through an exhausting research process, and we agonize over it. We consult our coworkers, our friends, our families. Perhaps we go to many retail establishments to try to choose just the perfect products for us. And finally, we select those products, we make those purchases, we select a delivery date, and we've even gotten our four hour window for delivery, right? And so we're sitting there waiting. Maybe we're ordering uh, some washers and dryers, but we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And then something like this happens, where we have a refrigerator that's delivered to us and this might be an older version of my uh, presentation, but I had a little arrow. Um, but you can see down here in this bottom right-hand corner, there's a nice big giant scratch across that refrigerator. Um, quite disappointing, as you can imagine. And as any consumer, um, you would likely make that quick snap decision to send that appliance right back with very little thought about what's going to happen to that appliance next. Because there's perhaps an assumption that this appliance is going to go back onto a retail floor or it's going to do something other than what is potentially likely that this will go to scrap. And that's a brand by brand decision, but think about that in the context of not how this product was packaged to get into your home, but what that environmental footprint will do with that one snap decision, which is given very little thought and I would not um, think that any of us might do anything otherwise, but it's something that's a reality that happens. And so when we're talking about packaging and what we're looking at packaging is that what we want to do with our packaging is making sure from the moment this product leaves the production line that it's to contents that prevent the situation and the scenario from happening. And so anything that we do, it goes from your manufacturing line, it goes to at least two to three warehouses. It will get packed with like products, it will get packed with unlike products. And everything that is put around this product is to prevent a situation like this. Its packaging is meant to absorb shock, it's meant to stabilize when appliances get stacked. We have ranges and refrigerators that get stacked in warehouses four to six high. And so there's a stabilization element that goes, to, goes into it and really assuring that we avoid any situation like this. And so um, how, how, we, how we look at our packaging and before I jump into anything is this is what our current materials composition looks like for our majors, which would be on the left side of your screen and our portables and floor care. And as you can see, we are already using quite a bit of cardboard, paper, wood, uh, we do use EPS, we do use some plastics and film plastics, which, which I've heard mentioned a few times today. Uh, very important uses for, for those single-use products on um, some of our larger appliances like a refrigerator, uh, dishwashers, for example. Uh, here are some of the packaging materials that you're going to see that we're currently using. Um, you saw those reflected in the pie chart. We have our, our wood pallets. We have different types of uh, cardboard. Uh, as you see those little little divots, I guess, uh, in those cardboards, it's actually called a flute. And it's a fluting system to, term, to determine shock and how to best preserve a package based on its weight. And so depending on how large that flute is, is how, how much protection you'll get and shock absorption you'll get as you're packaging with cardboard. And of course, uh, we have the extended, uh, expanded polystyrene there on the right hand side. So those are all of our uh, major uses uh, for packaging that go into our products. Uh, here is how we use those uh, products that you just saw to secure to secure appliances. And so you see it's a very minimal, and it was just about 6%, as I showed you on that pie chart, the use of EPS and, and other plastics into, into our major appliances. And I'll talk about small appliances, uh, portables and floor care in a, little, a few more slides. But here you're gonna see that we're using these, um, these long, um, you know, the, the name is uh, escaping me right now, but you're, you're gonna see your, your poles on the sides that's gonna bring you structural integrity, again, for stacking, not just in warehouses, but when you get into um, like rail and truck. And then you're gonna have your EPS on the corners and you're gonna have your EPS also underneath those appliances. And what happens with EPS and why it's so important is it's 
basically one of the only uh, uses that we've found and our manufacturers have found to properly absorb shock and not shock just once. And so if it's a drop, if it's a bump along a rail, a railway or a roadway, it will repeatedly absorb shock. And our members have done a, quite a bit of research to try to find and determine if there are other products that they can replace um, with the EPS and there, there are no options that will continually and re repeatedly absorb shock. So here's just a little bit of a look at some other plastics that we use, shrink versus stretch. And again, this is just related to uh, really how the, the, the plastic is being used in conjunction with the cardboard or, or the EPS. Uh, one, one, one interesting issue for consideration is as our members, not all the brands are moving into this more of a shrink wrap situation where they're just using EPS around the corners is that there, there is a higher damage rate that goes along with that. And so our members are also actively considering different ways to protect those products and, and going back to a more traditional uh, packaging uh, scheme as you see here on the left-hand side, which is, is more full, full cardboard to, to fully protect that box. Because again, as I had mentioned before, that environmental impact is much, much greater if you're having a major appliance return to a store, which then, um, as I said, most likely could go to scrap. And again, here's just another look at this. So we have these corner posts here you see on the left-hand side, and now we're getting into some shots and views of how a warehousing situation is set up. Um, in the next slides, we're gonna look at what stacking will look like. Um, but a lot of these, uh, these pictures are just depicting how we're getting into a situation where we're determining how we're gonna place these products into, into warehouse. And really, that's gonna be the first warehouse, which is the brand warehouse which is really distinguished from a major distribution center and then onto a retail uh, warehouse setting where you're gonna be packing these products with unlike products where that really increases the risk for damage and again, having that ability to absorb that shock is incredibly important. And so this is what it looks like, um, maybe not quite as daunting as when you see this in person, but you'll, you're gonna see ranges and refrigerators stacked four to six high in any warehouse. Uh, one thing that you have to, to keep in mind, uh, warehouses don't have a whole lot of temperature or climate control. And as we're developing uh, packaging strategies, one of the things that we do test to is extreme weather conditions. And so um, we can easily manage, uh, imagine here in Vermont, and I'm from Minnesota, so we can imagine those negative 20 uh, weather conditions in the winter, but we also test to um, how these products will withstand high heat, up to 150 degrees, because there are situations where you're going to have these products in their packaging sitting in those variant temperature conditions. And again, we want the integrity of those packages to hold up and withstand so that those products are arriving into the consumer's home the way they expect it to. And so one of, one of the interesting um, statistics that we had learned just recently is that as the percentage of humidity increases, and it's just by one percent uh, percentage point of humidity, you're losing an inch of stability in a cardboard box. And so when you think about that and you look at this, oh, what is that, two, four, five, five range stack high, think about 90% humidity and how the potential for the, the tippage comes in, and that's something that our members are testing too because safety obviously is a paramount concern uh, in warehouses and in every other aspect of our production. Moving, as I has, have mentioned several times, we use clamp trucks and other types of trucks to pick up these products and either load them onto rail cars or onto semis. Uh, again, uh, the design of the package will be taken into consideration how it's going to be moved from one place to another. And here's some technical challenges in the packaging design. So we've talked about the extreme heat and humidity, stacking, movement and transportation. So abrasion damage is, is one thing that I alluded to as we talked about this, the single use of plastic film. Uh, think about your stainless steel refrigerator or your dishwasher, for example. Uh, TVs, we don't represent uh, televisions, but this is an application for TVs as well as you get that single sheet of film that's put over the front of your refrigerator. That's to protect from scratches and abrasions like we saw earlier in that picture. Our members have are unable to identify any other source that's going to prevent any scratches from taking place. Um, during installation, during transportation, and so that's 
really important issue to take into consideration as well is that all of our packaging is in place for a purpose and it has a purpose and so it's to prevent against scratches and damage. Um, shipping and transportation, especially for small appliances, is, is a very interesting and one of the more interesting um, issues as, as we've been examining these issues, uh, consumer facing versus e-commerce and you have a number of different e-commerce channels, whether you're ordering from Amazon or Alibaba or you're ordering direct from the actual manufacturer. A lot of my members will sell direct to consumer. Uh, then you have your uh, brick and mortar packaging and they all are different streams and a lot of retailers will have different requirements for those small packages versus e-commerce. But our members are working to design across all of those spectrums. And for example, if you are sending something into a retail store, we have to test for a potential of five to seven touches. And that really means five to seven drops. And so we have to put our products into boxes that are going to withstand at least five to seven drops if it's put into a brick and mortar retail. So if you recall that uh, picture I showed you in the beginning of the flutes with the cardboard, those flutes are part of what absorbs that shock, as well as EPS. And so consumer is one thing that we also know is they do not like a lot of assembly when their small appliances are arriving to their homes. And EPS plays a role in that because EPS can hold the integrity of that appliance in place as it's moving through that system. On the e-commerce side, I should just mention very quickly, we test for 15 to 17 drops. And so it's very interesting when you're in one of these uh, testing facilities, they actually have drop machines and they actually have sequences as required um, by the retailer or by the e-commerce site of how a manufacturer should test the drops to make sure that that product remains intact and is still able to get into that consumer's home undamaged. And so um, I didn't originally think it would be that interesting, but it's actually quite fascinating to, to see all the effort that goes into making sure that the integrity of these products is maintained through this process. Um, so consumer assembly went over and then um, just as I said, there's a wide variety of standards and we're trying to, again, make sure that we get them all the way through that process. The other aspect that is a new trend that we're seeing is a lot of these e-commerce sites are trying to get rid of that exterior box. So think in your mind the last Amazon delivery that you got. You had an Amazon box and you opened your box and then you had your packaging which had all of the marketing materials and whatnot and then your product was inside of that box. And so there is a push by some of these e-commerce platforms to do away with that exterior box. And so then think about issues like having that box left on your front, front stoop and any passerby can see the contents of your delivery. And we've all seen all the news reports of, especially at Christmas time and the holidays, of those disappearing even in the Amazon boxes off your front porch. So these are issues that we're wrestling with, with packaging, and so um, just things that we're trying to, to keep, in, keep in mind. So, um, and this just goes into and kind of tries to bring together everything that we just talked about is, the problems and the challenges with our delivery channels. And so we're large products, core products, small appliances and parts are all different categories. Um, you have your examples up there with the large products. Uh, talks a lot about refrigerators, core products, laundry range, refrigerator, dishwasher, small appliances, our countertop microwaves, uh, garbage disposers, and then any replacement parts. Um, and so we all have bigger, each category has different issues. And so our biggest concern with those large products is the last 50 feet. It's going to be on a contracted delivery truck. Usually, if you live in a house, I live in a condo, so it's a little bit different, but if you live in a house, they're going to take the box and all the packaging off outside the home, get that refrigerator into the, the house and install. And so the big concern, again, is that last 50 feet. And so when we're talking about those protective films to prevent from scrapes and scratches and bumps, it becomes very important. The core products, mechanically assisted damage, and so we're talking about moving products and packing products against unlike products. And any time that package is touched and moved, potentially dropped, there's an opportunity for something to break inside the contents of that package. And so we're continually trying to, to work against that. And sm small packages, very same issue. We talked about the drop tests and, and all the research and uh, effort that goes into making sure those maintain their integrity and of course part, parts are easily shipped through UPS, FedEx, U USPS. So dropping dropping is gonna be our, our biggest issue and problem right there. So and just moving on, so we have done 
a bit of research about alternatives. And we're not going to be shy about telling you a lot of these al alternatives are very expensive. A lot of these alternatives are not available in a great enough variety, or I don't want to say variety, but great enough quantity, that's the right word, that it's an, an easy switch. Um, but there, there are some alternatives. EPS is a major challenge. There's, there's not product out there that can continually and repeatedly absorb uh, shock and drops and, um, and everything that our members are using EPS in their products for. Again, it's a very small percentage of what we're putting into our, our packaging, yet very critical. Um, the second page just kind of goes into some other issues, one that usually gets a nice little chuckle is the mushroom packaging, which is actually a thing. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, again, very cost uh, prohibitive and doesn't stand up in weather conditions. So this would not be a, a use for anywhere south of where I live in Virginia, I would suppose. So um, just moving on, some you know issues that we're identifying and, and grappling and trying to get our, our arms around with plastic recycling policy uh, across the board, and, and I think Kathy talked about it and others have talked about it, is that there's not a broad recycling infrastructure in America. Probably shouldn't be because every jurisdiction is different, but the lack of an infrastructure makes identifying the best solution very difficult because it's definitely going to be a case-by-case -case issue, uh, but something that we're identifying as something that really should be addressed perhaps before some of these larger, uh, bigger um, policy issues because we need to have something in place that can actually handle and manage that whole process. Um, lack of industry control over recyclable materials. Once, once our products leave our warehouse, in every case, our manufacturers have lost the ability con to control that product because the consumer has, has made that purchase and it's very difficult for us from that kind of a supply chain perspective to control what happens to that product after the fact. Uh, lack of market for recycled plastics, we've talked a lot about that already today. Uh, failure to distinguish between ICNI and reci uh, residential recycling. And so ICNI is just business to business. And, and how, how do those products get handled? And, um, and our members, again, are doing quite a bit there as well. And this is, I think, something that's common. You know, we, we look at this access to recycling programs as perhaps a place to start um, because of one of our biggest concerns here is uh, EPR costs a lot. And it's a, it's a major cost. And we aren't convinced that it is, it is the solution. And um, we're here at the table because we want to work with you um, to identify um, areas where we can work together to, to really improve the situation. And as I had mentioned, we're um, working hard with a, a pretty large group of our members to continue to identify um, areas um, that we can you know, do even better. But our members are working at this issue every single day. And um, just uh, we were at a company about a month ago who has a goal by 2020, at least on their major manufacturing facilities, to be at zero waste. And so we have you know, lots of anecdotes and, and things like that that we're hearing from our producers. Um, and our attempt is to bring all of that information together to share it back. So to, we just believe that all of that will help you um, identify the best policy solutions here. So uh, I think that's my last slide. So I can answer any questions if you have any. Okay. Well, thank you. Any questions from the panel? Sorry. Um, just, I was just curious, so you've described a lot of kind of unique challenges. Mm -hmm. just, just curious what like some percentage is home appliances of the waste stream of the packaging? Mm -hmm. and maybe Kathy knows if you don't. Oh gosh, I don't. Actually, actually, I like don't very, know. Kind of I'll have to see if we have that data, but I don't think we have that data. Because um, a lot of our, it's, recy it's recycled, recycled, and as I had mentioned again, particularly where majors are concerned, um, if it's contracted, the contractor is the one who's recycling the cardboard, the pallets, um, any of the plastic material. Um, and then again, if it's if it's a portable or floor care, that's going to be something that the consumer does. And so it's that data. I, I mean, I'll, I'll go back and check and see if we have any data like that. But I mean, I think it's probably we shared it if we had it. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, just looking at your last slide on EPR, mm -hmm. I mean, you're saying it's very 
costly. It's costly to you, the producer. I mean, we're already paying to deal with this right. stuff, mm -hmm. so we're yeah. we're paying for it. It's, right. it's shifting the cost onto the manufacturer, or more accurately, reflecting the cost of what we're the, the full system. Yeah, but I think manufacture it. Yeah, I mean, I think the reality though is that, um, and again, and I, and I don't want to say this because it's, it sounds hard and fast, but the general response is, I know you probably well know, and not surprised that I'll say this, is that that's going to get passed on to consumers. And so the consumers are going to pay one way or the other. And so our interest is, how do we do better? Like from our full value chain. And so that's, that's really what we're looking at, rather than having um, a program like this. I mean, I think there, there are challenges with this. Um, and, you know, we have a, a office up in Canada and we're, you know, we wrestle with EPR issues in Canada all, all the time. So um, it's just, you know, we want to try to work with folks to identify the policies that make sense for, for everybody who's at the table. Just one, one more question to, to look at your slide here in terms of the administrative cost. That's something that, that is new and will be on top of just the waste collection cost. Right. So, yeah, consumers are already paying, and or there's already a portion of solid waste that we have to manage, but creating a new quasi governmental PR organization comes with additional administrative costs, registration fees, staffing, those types of things, which one could argue is a role of the government, a role of the state government. You know, that's something perhaps for us to, to consider. What's the most efficient way to collect more and recycle more, right? Because that's the goal. Right. What's the most efficient way to get there, I think, is what I took away from that yeah. one. I'd be interested in any data sure. for that graph. Mm -hmm. sure. You could send that along. That'd yep. be great. Thanks. This one. If you can wrap by 420, oh, sure. stick to the same, no, no less time, but I just want to make sure we don't go over because we'll need 10 minutes to wrap up for the day. Well, actually, I was going to say, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to congratulate you. I know it's looking like I'm sucking up to you, but I have never, I don't know the last time I was in a legislative uh, agenda that actually st stuck to the stuck to the schedule as well as the has today. Um, so, uh, for the record, William Driscoll with Associated Industries of Vermont. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide some initial comments, really kind of questions to ask. Um, you know, and, uh, certainly this is something that's going to be an ongoing conversation and we look forward to continue to participate. Um, but, you know, EPR is a very broad very policy approach. It means a lot of different things to different people. There's a million different ways to go about it. And really how effective it is and how appropriate it is can vary widely across products and industries, across uh, jurisdictions and the size of the jurisdiction, um, and also getting into the actual program details. So addressing the specific pros and cons of how one could or should uh, or not apply the EPR to the charge of the working group, um, in some ways depends a lot on the more specifics that might, if this, as this discussion continues to evolve and we get more more detail in terms of uh, the feedback. Can I ask just a quick question for sort of like a baseline? Since we have a group of DPR programs already, do you have concerns about those? I mean, before we talk about extending our mm -hmm. position on, or does your, um, does the EIV have a position on the effectiveness, appropriateness of the current EPR program? Uh, there are definitely strengths and weaknesses relative across them. I, you know, I would. If you want a detailed conversation about that, I want to go back and look at it. But I think, um, for example, we were supportive of the paint program mm -hmm. um, that, you know, maybe wasn't perfect, but had a lot of positive attributes. Um, I know that there are concerns. It's been a long time since I've worked on it myself directly, but I know that there are concerns with the e-waste program. And, um, you can go through the different examples and relative strengths and weaknesses. Um, but, uh, and, and frankly, a lot of those programs are obviously very much more focused um, and more discreet in terms of the kind of products that they are addressing. And the more discreet you make an EBR program, the more variable some of the pros and cons can be. Um, so the issues I'm sort of raising today are actually more focused on sort of broad EPR approaches, particularly with regard to packaging. Um, that tends to be a fairly broad uh, topic to try to take on. Um, and I want to try to sort of go walk through them in the context of the five charges that 
this working group has been good to look at um, specifically. So the first, you know, is obviously the, the goal of re to reduce the use of single-use products. Um, and so some of the issues to look at there, um, and you actually got a, 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 an introduction to that with the previous witness, is that, you know, the working group should work to understand how single-use products, particularly packaging, um, how the use and design is really driven by quality, health and safety, efficiency, presentation and availability for consumers, and how those sort of performance requirements are significant drivers in terms of what you actually have for the use and design of, of packaging. Um, and those sort of restraints or requirements limit the ability for an EPR program to have much change on those, uh, on those considerations uh, or those constraints, particularly in the context of a Vermont, a Vermont EPR uh, program. That being said, manufacturers are motivated to minimize costs, including materials, regardless of whether there's an EPR uh, cost on the packaging. Um, there are also sustainability goals that companies have and marketing consumer appeal motivations um, that are driving uh, design, uh, design issues and um, uh, the amount of packaging issues that are unrelated to whether or not there's an EPR context. Um, so it would be helpful, I think, for the working group to work to understand how industry already has uh, and continues to work to reduce unnecessary packaging or increase recyclability of products based on those much larger market contexts and sort of the practical technology and materials opportunities um, that, again, would not necessarily be meaningfully changed uh, by a Vermont EPR program. Um, I think it was worth noting here, though, uh, you know, my understanding, and you can certainly hear from uh, witnesses who are more expert uh, in the field, it's my understanding that the evidence has not suggested that the existing EPR programs for packaging, say in Europe or in Canada, have had themselves much of an impact on packaging design um, and other issues like that. Um, that's not surprising given some of the factors I just went over. Uh, but folks have raised uh, today the idea of, of having uh, modulated charges. Uh, and certainly, you can understand the logic of how a modulated charge could be intended or designed to try to have an effect on manufacturers' decisions like that. I think it just simply raises the questions to, to look at is, you know, how well designed is the modulated price going to be? Is it really going to provide the sort of positive feedback loop that would be um, hoped to have a change uh, like that? For example, if it's simply modulation based on weight, is that really kind of a sort of a ham-fisted approach that doesn't really necessarily motivate uh, the kind of changes in design or, or other issues that you might be looking at. And then frankly, is Vermont a large enough market that no matter how perfectly modulated a regime you might have, is that really going to have a meaningful impact on the costs under consideration uh, for companies to really motivate that change, um, especially relative to the larger market modulations that are already driving in that direction. Um, so those I think that would be something to be asking about and be realistic about. Um, two of the other uh, goals of the, of the working group, obviously, to, one is to reduce uh, the environmental impact of single use products and also to prevent contamination of natural resources by discarded single use products. Um, so there's some considerations there. Uh, it's also similar to the, to the uh, diversion um, goal as well. So, with regard to, you know, there's different ways you look at what the environmental impact or contamination. One is you know, the material composition of the packaging itself or of the product. Um, and I think it would be helpful for the work to understand how sort of the material issues, whether it's toxicity or other um, aspects, how those are driven by existing health and environmental regulations uh, within the performance constraints that I've already discussed and how those are the real drivers of those, of those characteristics and not necessarily uh, EPR um, itself. Uh, and again, doesn't, my understanding is there's not much evidence that EPR has had an impact on those kind of questions um, historically, and the limitations of Vermont having a different impact, even with the modulated charge structure, might be, you know, might, I, may not be a realistic expectation. Um, the other aspect of this, these goals is whether or not these materials actually end up being recycled or if they end up going into a landfill. Um, and I think there are two main drivers on that that, that, that the group should really look at that may or may not really be uh, something that could be affected by EPR per se. 
The first is clearly, is there a market for recycled materials? So is there actually some place for it to go other than, other than the landfill? Um, and there are a lot of factors involved in terms of whether that market exists, how can we try to grow or improve that market? Um, and I guess the question for the group is, really, is how would EPR change that availability of a market for the products? And is that really the tool that gets you toward, for that particular goal or not? Um, and the second, and this is really one of the, one of the critical things, ultimately whether a product is recycled and recycled properly or ends up in the landfill comes down to with decisions by the, by the consumer. You know, what are they going to do with that packaging? What are they going to do with that product? Um, and a lot of this is obviously driven by awareness, education, and incentives for the consumer to do the right thing. Um, and is EPR necessary, or is EPR uh, necessarily the most effective way to drive those, those factors? And you know, I think it's a question to really take a serious look at, because I'm not sure it's immediately clear that it is. Um, one thing I think I would note, and this is often comes up, uh, with EPR proposals is one of the other factors for individual consumer decisions is um, convenience. Obviously, the more convenient you can make it to do the right thing with the product, the more, it's, the more you're going to have a positive impact. Um, and certainly, if you look at some of the more narrowly focused EPR programs that have looked at, especially looking at hard to handle or difficult products or inconvenient products, um, when you have an EPR, a new EPR program that has come in and introduced convenience where previously there wasn't, you haven't seen a positive impact, and that's not that's not surprising. One would expect that, but it's the convenience that's driving that, and you don't have to have EPR to have a more convenient system. Uh, state programs and services, local programs and services, competition through the holidays. There's all sorts of things that can uh, lead to more convenience being provided to consumers. Um, that would then have a positive impact on recycling that aren't that don't require EPR to make those things happen. Um, so it's just and and you know I think it's not clear to me that convenience is the most is a is a is a is, su is such a huge and critical issue in this particular area since we're talking about some fairly basic recyclables where um, whether you know. Uh, Act 148 requirements for for um, options for consumers, or just to, just to know the state of the of the infrastructure. Um, I'm not sure. It's not clear to me that convenience is a is a, is a really big serious problem. Um, certainly one that can't be further improved through any number of means um, beyond beyond uh, EPR. Um, so the other goal uh, is to improve statewide management of single use products. Um, I don't know if the committee has discussed what that means in terms of is this like a smooth operation or some other aspect of what, what good management means. So I guess the questions would be for the group is if in the context of EPR, is creating there's sort of two two basic approaches you could take. One, um, industry is required to create a whole brand new collection system, a whole new um, infrastructure system, either on top of or to replace the existing one. You know, um, from a good management perspective, is that really a, a good idea? Um, and then the other way is basically to have industry pay for the existing system. And simply changing who pays for the system, how is that going to improve the management, per se? Uh, so again, that would be a question to, to look into further because it's not immediately clear to me how, how that's done. Um, and then finally, divert, divert single-use products from the disposal of, uh, in landfills. Um, this is really somewhat overlaps some of the other things that we've talked about um, in terms of you know making the, the drive to make packaging and other products more recyclable. There are there are big market forces that are that are pushing that to the extent that it can be done. It's not clear that EPR would change those forces, um, and ultimately it really does come down to how can you best educate and motivate consumers to make the right decisions. Um, and there are certainly industry programs, particularly with regard to education, that can help with that. And I think it'd be good to hear from, from industry groups as to what they're doing in those lines and what, what support um, and participation or cooperation is available for Vermont. Um, but those aren't necessarily EPR programs per se. So really, just to boil down, I think there's a lot of progress toward the goals that have been given to this working group that industry's already pursuing. 
for bigger reasons than EPI. Um, and there are a lot of goals that really come down to um, individual consumer decisions, which driving those is something that is really not, does not fit well, I think, into, or exclusively certainly into the EPR um, approach. Um, so I just do that. One last thing, because uh, there's been a lot of talk about it today, about the uh, cost shift and trying to relieve um, these valleys or solid waste districts and districts and some of the costs that they're facing. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of questions about that. Uh, especially with regard to whether that's really saving Vermonters money, whether it really helps the consumers, or whether it's simply just moving things around. Um, there's a lot of factors to look into. I think it's highly variable as to which manufacturers, to the extent that they would or could pass those costs, um, either in whole or in part, on the consumers. It's, I think to suggest that that's not going to happen is pretty unrealistic. Um, and to the extent that that does happen, you know, there's all sorts of things to think about. If you're imposing a cost for service up at the beginning of the markup chain, and that gets factored into the underlying initial cost, and as that product works its way through distribution and retail, and, all, and you get the markups that you normally get, is that cost going to be inflated along with everything else down the, world, down the line and end up costing more at the end of the consumer and than it would have if it had started there? Uh, there's additional administrative costs. I think uh, uh, Mr. Hackman brought up that, that issue. If you're looking at uh, an EPR approach that's more or less sort of, we'll just pay for what uh, the current system does, or a blank check approach, what does that do to accountability and incentives to be cost effective in the services that you're provided if you're basically going to be paid to do uh, it regardless? I think uh, Mr. Chairman, you brought the concept of if you have a tangible connection between a consumer and, a, and something that they have paid, they've paid for the service, how does that affect their incentives to actually make use of that service? I think actually that's a very important connection, and I think that's something um, that's a real factor that should be um, kept in mind. And again, this is sort of discussed a little bit earlier today too. But you know, realistically, you know, if you offset the cost that's being driven from an existing tax or an existing fee, is that tax or fee really going to be reduced commensurately? You know, I think it's a political reality. It doesn't, that doesn't always happen. So shifting those costs is not necessarily a good, um, a good solution for consumers. It's very understandable why some folks would like the idea of you know, cost, especially if it's an expensive program, of those costs being changed away so that they're more hidden from consumers. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right thing to do. Um, and, it, and frankly, if you look through the statute, if you look at the charge for this working group and the things you're supposed to be looking at, um, shifting that cost off of existing providers is not listed. As a goal or a priority uh, for the group. Um, and so I think it would be unfortunate if that became the primary driver of the discussion here. So, okay. Just some um, things to think about. Yeah, so just to make sure I understand that your last point. Mm -hmm. um, here's, in terms of the charge, mm -hmm. which we were reviewing earlier today, so what part of the charge, I'm not quite sure I followed, what part of the charge? Um, this is a point that you think maybe ought to be part of our charge in terms of mm -hmm. shifting costs and missing them. Well, I mean, that it's explicitly tried to shift the cost off of existing providers and onto manufacturers. That's not in the that's not a direction given to the to the community. I mean, to the working group. I think people may try to argue how it may factor into some of the other charges, and we can have that debate discussion. But it's not it's not on its face a, a, a goal that was given. To Um, any questions for Mr. Driscoll? Other questions? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, one of the other charges I thought was to come up with a list of items that are supposed to be or considered for inclusion under this. Um, the, so it's kind of hard to think about what kind of extended permissive or responsibility program you put in place without understanding what materials we're talking about. Um, and I'd like to hear from some of the distributors um, on some of the challenges that they may have with some of these extended producer responsibility laws. Um, I know the bottle bill was brought up today. I don't think that's really a charge of this group. Yeah. Decide whether or not we expand that or not. Um, but I'd like to hear from some distributors on some of the challenges they could face. Sure. And sorry, um, when you say distributors, what kind of distributors are we talking about? So, um, 
Foley, Claire in the room here also, um, you know, there there's thousands and thousands of manufacturers of these products, but if you're talking about getting them to one state that has a program, how do, how do those products get distributed and separated and, and entered into this type of program? And then I think we also need to consider what markets are in place, depending upon what items we choose, what markets are in place and available to recycle these materials. Because I think there have been some unintended consequences with the electronic waste um, producer responsibility law you can read across the country about warehouses after warehouses with abandoned CRTs that manufacturers paid into a program to recycle but now are left abandoned and no home for. So I think we need to consider unintended consequences as well. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, I said at the last meeting and I'll reiterate it again, um, just asking solid waste entities and municipal entities, um, other interest groups um, that are working in the system we have now, whether there's any kind of low hanging fruit or improvements in the system as is that can sort of help um, what's not working or what is working, especially when we're talking about the costs, um, regardless of where they're born, um, trying to get the most bang for your buck for any changes we make within the system, so. I'm, I'm um, lining up with him on, on identifying products. Um, products can mean, can also mean types of packaging um, as well as um, Plastic restaurant wear, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so it could be products could mean uh, it could be a sort of a broad thing, but it can also mean specific things. And I, I do think we need to um, have a better understanding of of the specific, and then to uh, then understand how we're going to deal with it. Um, and which may, which products may actually be best um, managed through ERP and which may be best managed through a ban. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think um, echoing a lot of what I've heard already, um, it sounds like if the next meeting is going to be hearing from more um, kind of stakeholders and experts, um, it seems like soon we need to be looking at you know what are some of the policy proposals like bans and other things we've started hearing about um, EPR, but you know maybe we're putting the charge out to all of us the meeting after to come in with some more specific proposals that are looking at you know product categories and what we might do about them so we can get start making it more tangible to. Um, react to and get input on and then that might kind of elicit which further expertise like would it be helpful to hear from someone from one of the other states who are working on um, similar bills um, and that kind of thing um, so that would be my recommendation or idea um, the other thing I wanted to raise was at, at some point it might be helpful to build in some opportunity for public input mm -hmm. as well <clears throat> it was good to hear um, that there'll be some testimony lined up around uh, health impacts and the other um, items that you mentioned, Senator Bray. Yeah. Um, and looking at single-use products and um, I'm lining up with that comment as well. Um, you know, looking at what what products do we want to include or what, um, in any system we have. Uh, the division between bands and um, other management systems. Um, and maybe somewhere in there as we talk today about like modulating fees, what criteria would we use as a group or suggest for further investigation um, for ranking those materials? Because 
and as Kim mentioned, CRT glass, which was you know maybe a byproduct of a former EPR system, mm -hmm. um, was collected because it's a hazardous material and something that we didn't want in landfills. We were trying to force uh, other management of, and so identifying those um, you know the highest need materials for greater management would be useful. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I would like to find out more about the work that Maine's doing and see if that aligns with any of the goals that's tasked with this group. Um, because I think that could be, that could cut to the chase maybe a little bit. Could, um, could, you, could you say that again? Because I can know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So I would like to um, find out more about what Maine is doing with Maine. their EPR um, work, the, the bill that they're working on at the state level, um, because I think that might, and to see how that aligns with some of the tasks that this group is, is, um, is tasked to do. Uh, in that same vein, I would like to find out a little bit more about the Canadian programs and the advancement of the modulating fees potentially and how implementation of, of those programs worked with the existing system that was already in place because that's what we're looking at here as well um, to just see how that transition happened and I would like to know more about the Vermont haulers' perspective on that and how EPR would potentially be transitioned into what they're doing and what their perspective is. Specifically, probably Casella or Myers, like the larger haulers. Andy. Yep. Um, so, one, in terms of getting an idea of what costs whatever program we create is trying to cover. I've heard 30 million, I think that was in Connecticut or Massachusetts, <coughs> and then 15 to 17 million in Maine. Now I know their numbers, just a rough estimate. So if we've got any ideas on whatever program or outcome we have, what type of cost we're trying to reimburse or cover, what's the scope of that universe, perhaps. Um, I would support an investigation of the markets to understand what changes happen in the markets and what markets either aren't there or would need to be there to, to help you know make the system function better regardless of whatever we, we recommend. Um, and then in terms of low hanging fruit and sort of programs other than EPR, I would encourage some outreach and I can help provide some contact with the recycling partnership and improving current systems uh, and the program that they have which is a voluntary uh, industry sort of program that's been working around the country. Uh, so I encourage understanding what work they are doing so that we can uh, understand that and see if there are efficiencies that aren't in the system right now. Great. Okay. So, plenty of things to work on. Um, but it's, I'd say a common thread was um, being more product specific, right? To narrow it down from all the universe of things we might focus on. Right? Um, and so, um, I don't want to put uh, the you know the, the two of you are sitting side by side on the spot, but for people running uh, programs at the street level, you know I think um, part of what we can do is be thinking about again it fits into the low hanging fruit and also I don't know if you because of your day to day operations see materials coming through and you say. If this is the most problematic material, or maybe the other side of the coin is here's the material that represents the biggest opportunity for um, a financially positive stream to deal with, like a, a financial opportunity or something, we can look at identifying from really like an operational level where you see some opportunities. And I would think, Kim, you must have some feedback on that, right? Especially in like the market side of things where things are going. Yeah. And Kathy. <laughs> so I would ask people, I'll follow up with you between now and next meeting because we're really, we're over by five minutes. I apologize. Um, 
but uh, so we already will have some practitioners in next meeting already uh, so we can hear from some people who are executing on this kind of thing and learn from them work on identifying products more that we narrowing our universe a little bit to identifying products more narrowly working more into recyclables marketplaces and the low hanging fruit piece seems like a, a some useful thing more than enough to keep us busy for the next um, meet, next meeting of yeah um, and Andy if you can give Michael and Mike the recycling partnership information and uh, two meetings out we're connecting with Jess yep. okay. can you remind the group who he is and who uh, he's done evaluations of different programs around the country he's worked for the National Waste and Recycling Association great all right anything uh, so uh, Thank you, everyone. Any any parting comments? Anyone have something you want to add? Yes, you want to. One thing that didn't come up that I was just thinking back to Scott's great presentation. And he talked about clarity of goals and what are we trying to accomplish. Yeah. So, just thinking it could be worth time before we're kind of crafting a system of like, do we have a shared understanding of what we're trying to accomplish, and therefore what are the best tools to get there? Um, even if we might not agree on what those tools are, can we get to a like, do we get there? You've got the charge of the from the. Um, Statute, but like grounding ourselves in what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I thought that was. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was thinking about that um, and forgot to write it down. So, they, right, if you're trying to solve a problem, you better identify the problem pretty clearly and agree <laughs> what the problem definition is first. Okay. So, thank you, everyone.